Our first presentation, I'm very uh, pleased to have Dr. Gene Bottoms, who is the Senior Vice President of the Southern Regional Education Board. Uh, most of you probably know that the SREB uh, represents, uh, Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, 15? 16. 16 uh, Southeastern United States states. And uh, Dr. Bottoms, uh, Gene, if we can call you that, Gene, since fine. you got your coat off, uh, uh, has been with them for a few years. And uh, I have been impressed at several meetings uh, at his presentations, especially as they relate to some work and uh, study that he's done dealing with high school graduation, college and career readiness and, and those issues that are continuing concerns. So he has agreed to come and share some of his insight uh, and thoughts on that. And then we're gonna have, uh, after Dr. Bottoms, some folks from uh, DPI and Department of Commerce and, yes, DPI and Department of Commerce will have some uh, comments to make on some related topics. And after lunch, Dr. Bottoms and several others are gonna be a panel to discuss some of these and the interrelationships. Uh, so we can interrupt Dr. Bottoms as we go with questions, but you'll also get another chance uh, if you wanna hold it and sort of see what more there is to come. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Bottoms, I didn't tell about all your credentials and where you went to school. If you think it's important for us to know, we'll let you toot your horn briefly at the beginning, but otherwise, We'll let you come up to that mic if you would. And thank you for coming from Atlanta. Uh, while he's getting there, also committee members, if you will fill out your uh, travel and subsistence request form. Uh, Dr. Bottoms, I've just received a technological update. Okay. Uh, the PowerPoint apparently is going to require you to be up here and use this clicker. All right. So we'll invite you to come on up here. taken. 
North Carolina's problems are not unique to the other SRAV states. All the states, in fact, much of the nation has suffered from a similar issue. If you boil it down in one sentence, the workplace requirements have risen faster than how our have we been able to raise the quality of education experiences. And there is a growing gap between the qualifications of persons and the requirements of the workplace. And how we close those. It's not that education has gotten worse, it's the best it's ever been. But the demand and complexity of the workplace have risen much faster. And that kind of in a nutshell, as we move through today to take a look at some of this, your state, uh, If you pay attention to some of the folks who make projections in the country, uh, since 1970, we've had a steady rise in the educational needed to obtain a good job. Based on current trends in the early 2020s, it's projected that 67% of the jobs in North Carolina will require some post-secondary education and training some kind of advanced credential, an associate, master's degree, or higher. Now, when you look at that, um, SRAB states range from about 55% of the folks will need that in the lowest state to 69% when we look at uh, Maryland and Virginia, and you arrive at the top of that list with 67%. So all the states are struggling with gaps. The number that has surprised me these numbers. If you go back to 1973, 72% uh, of jobs could be filled by folks who had a high school diploma or less. About 28% were filled by folks who had an associate or a bachelor's degree. And you can see the shift over time that's occurred. If you look 2007, you will see that 32% uh, of the jobs require a master's degree, 29 an associate, and 39% uh, a high school education or less. But the jobs that have been added to the economy since 2010, since 2007, Six percent fewer of those jobs were filled by folks with high school diploma or less. Master's degree have grown to 36 percent. Associate degrees remain about the same. Uh, if you look at some projections we found on North Carolina, some of your folks have made, you found a similar picture. About 34 percent require a high school curriculum or less. 34 percent. Associate, 32 percent master's degrees. Now, all that said, North Carolina, like most of our states, there's a growing gap. Well, let's first look at the national figures, and then we have put together a chart that kind of looks at North Carolina data we found in your state. Uh, much of this you may already know. But between 2010 and 2014, there were six. 6 million jobs added during that recovery period. 2.9 million, or 44%, were good jobs. Good jobs are defined as paying $52,000 or more a year. Compared to just 1.8 million low wage jobs, paying under $32,000 a year. About 27%. Then you have about 1.9 million jobs, 29% were middle wage jobs to pay between $32,000 and $52,000 a year. So that kind of gives you a, a breakout of, of the levels of jobs and what's happening in our economy in the last few years. The, the areas of the good jobs, if you take a look at those good jobs, 2.9 million were good jobs. 1.8 million were managerial and professional office occupations. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, computer science, healthcare, technical occupations made up the next largest group of jobs. Uh, as you can 
you say about one point? Gotta go to the next slide. See, I did not. Okay. Sometimes I get so interested hearing myself talk, I forget to move those slides. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, as you can see, the STEM jobs are about to, um, the manager of professional made up about 1.8. You see the jobs that made up the next large category of STEM. Healthcare was the next category. The, uh, by contrast, about 184,000 jobs lost in the country in education. Some of those have been recovered since 2014, but as there was a downsize, and you lost about 71,000 jobs in blue collar work. Those primarily as manufacturing began to shift over to advanced manufacturing requiring much higher level skill sets, but not the, uh, the low level skill job in previous years. The, uh, look at the areas of middle and low wage jobs, predominant low wage jobs are the food service, personal services, sales, office support. The uh, high percent of those, those uh, middle wage jobs are in, in blue collar work, where there's a tremendous shortage today in health care, but some of the low wage jobs are also in the health care area. Uh, that gives you a sense of where the jobs are. Blue collar wage jobs with strong growth during the recovery. Construction, miscellaneous assemblers, fabrication, freight, stock, stock and material movers, packaging, those were those low paying jobs that are in demand. Now when you look at, we look at North Carolina data, you have a group of jobs that you've projected as higher salary jobs, some would be in the good job, category, middle job wage range. You projected the number of jobs uh, annually that would be available in those occupations. And uh, so we looked at projected annual openings in these occupational areas. You have that, for those of you who have a blue folder, you have that sheet inside. Probably going to have difficulty reading this. Uh, take a look at this information. Uh, architectural and construction projected that there would be about 14,000 jobs annually. And you can see about 33% of those jobs were classified in the $32,000 or higher. 67% were classified in the uh, in, in the uh, $52,000 or higher. When you looked at the secondary enrollment in the field, and you looked at the post-secondary enrollment, you found a uh, a gap, annual gap between enrollment and the number of jobs of almost over 7,500 folks in that area. Now these are not just labor jobs in industry. There is a the construction industry are looking for good managers who can help manage a lot of construction projects, particularly in the commercial area, in the whole range of occupations. You have that list. But we pulled those jobs that had a large growth area. You look at business management and administration. 22,603 annual jobs. Half of those jobs pay between 32,052. Half pay over 32. When you look at the number enrolled in high school and post-secondary, there's a gap of almost 10,000 10, persons there, which suggests that one needs to rethink through pathways in high school in this area. They're more aligned to the post-secondary associate and of the advanced degree. If you look at finance, uh, you see there was a 
high number of jobs there, over 6,000 jobs annually. 25% would fall into the $30,000 middle wage. 75% fall in the other category. But it implies a need for kind of a financial pathway at the beginning in high school to introduce youth to this field, this field of opportunity with some pretty deep study, and there are some model designs around for that area. In healthcare, 16,000, 18,000 plus jobs annually. 31% would pay in the $32,000 range. 69% would pay in the $52,000. You have a gap of over 12,000 between the high school and post-secondary. It does mean new kinds of pathways in high schools that's better aligned to those post-secondary opportunities in this field. The human services, as you can see there, you have an oversupply in that field in terms of those projected demands. If you look at information technology, uh, you look at... Okay, there it gets back. Good. <coughs> Thank you. Information technology, we have some pretty high enrollments in both secondary and post-secondary there, and you see an oversupply. Now what does that mean? I'm not sure, but one scenario is that we may have been focusing too much just on those jobs in the information area that are at a lower level. You can see about 30% of these 32,000, about 80% are in the high category range, but we have tremendous openings. If you look in your report that you have a computer science commission, we have, I think if you look on page two, you'll find tremendous number of openings in computer science, cybersecurity, and we're bringing in almost 100,000 people a year from other countries to fill those jobs. We have too few pathways beginning in high school and community colleges and even four years. Program at Georgia Tech, for example, in computer science is just about dried up. There's no pathway of students entering into that field. So we have to begin to introduce students in high school to different kinds of curriculum. AP computer science has not worked very well. It's too theoretical. If we're going to pull a lot more students into this field, we're going to have to build around project-based learning where kids actually do work like they would do in the real world. In manufacturing, if you look at law and public safety, between the high school and community colleges, you have a uh, substantial uh, oversupply there. That uh, may or may not be true, but these numbers, this is what the numbers show. In manufacturing, uh, you have uh, about almost 3,000 student gap there in that field. And uh, that suggests a new kind of manufacturing curriculum in First, 100% of those jobs that we looked at were in the middle range, 32 to $52,000 range. In STEM, you see another gap in STEM, almost 6,000 students. Uh, I suspect the numbers may not truly capture STEM. There are an awful lot of jobs today that require STEM-like thinking. Uh, that may not be classified. They recently have reclassified STEM to include computer science into that category. Both are such a demand. But then in transportation, you see the slot stories there. So that gives you, if you take a look at uh, the national data, as we looked at your data, these are some gaps that exist that would imply that one needs to begin to think about. The takeaway I have from that is something this. A need for structured pathways of study beginning in high school that's connected to two-year institutions, to four-year, and to employers, particularly in uh, construction, business, administration, finance, health science, manufacturing, STEM, and even in transportation. Because even the top credential you get in transportation and mechanics probably do not have enough time in the high school curriculum to get that has to be carried on into the community college. The, um, as you think about pathways, it may very well mean that those pathways, we have to think more about career pathways connecting to a college-ready core in high school. 
thinking about pathway for parent students for double purpose. Both are uh, work and post-secondary studies. And it means connecting three levels of learning, high school, post-secondary, and the workplace. And it means a guidance system that focuses more on going to college, but more on helping kids figure out a career and a pathway to that. We have made kind of going to college the end goal, not a reason for college. That is a real shift that we have to begin to think about. So those are some of the takeaways I would leave with you on that particular piece of data. And I'm going to use my prerogative of my to interrupt. Uh, I think this information is pretty critical, and I just wondered if he, I've got a couple questions before we move on, if I may, but I wanted to see if any committee members. Representative Goodman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that presentation. I'm curious about the correlation uh, on the annual 32,000 salary category on some of these things and uh, K-12 uh, education. It would seem to me that the jobs that are the, at the low wage could be uh, the training and the, and the career path should pretty much be completed at K-12, or am I wrong about that, that the post-secondary requirement would come into play more on the 53 and up? Uh, I, I'm just wondering if our at K-12, are we missing the boat? there on those low wage jobs or, or what's the correlation there? That's a good question. Uh, the, you're going to have to prepare for both beginning in high school. Uh, you're going to have to, the pathways, one of the problems you have, you only have about 40% or less of your students how the literacy and math foundation to pursue these advanced level jobs. So you're looking, and when you begin to look hard at some of these credential jobs, social degree jobs, they require a very similar literacy and math level that you're going to find for a baccalaureate degree. And, and so one of the challenges we face all across the South is raising the literacy and math level of students. And uh, Many of these jobs are hidden from young people today. So, you know, think about Bill Gates. He started working on computers at the eighth grade around projects, doing things. We have to begin to introduce students much earlier in high school to project-based learning where they can really begin to test themselves out around some of these new career fields. It means a different kind of design. To answer your question, it's, yes, you can focus on but as I look over your offerings in high school, you have a high percent of youth in the health field. Now we're working with one state right now, how to strengthen the math and science of that health field so that many of those students can, yes, can go ahead and get the nurse's aid certificate, but may go on and get the practical nursing, the rest of the nursing certificate. You begin to tie a, a, a much tighter college ready core together. Think about high school where you have a pure college preparatory track. Take those college ready courses. But you also have other kids taking that same courses but their focus is in a career area. While that traditional college focus may be three or four courses at AP. Does that make any sense? What we're doing and what you're doing and what several of our states are doing, we're still teaching three levels of English high school. Slow, a little bit faster than slow, and then we've got the real fast track for kids. That's the English course that engages you in reading grade level text and, grade, and, and, and uh, doing that kind of analysis. We have three levels of biology. One I call definition biology. You, you memorize definition of terms. You're never engaged in reading the science text. Um, highest failed course in high school, uh, and in career tech. Uh, you can teach career tech without ever engaging kids in reading the language of that field. 
but that's old Voltaic. Today you're going to have to engage in reading that language. You can also give a Simons to Career Tech where you never have to use mathematics. But in the modern workplace, the employer's looking at folks who have a sense of mathematics. So you have to rethink about it. If, you, if I can use a simple <coughs> analogy, we still have too many of our students in the shallow end of the swimming pool, both in academic studies and career tech studies. And to get to have two thirds of our youth prepare for these jobs that are emerging, you're going to have to have more folks in deep end of learning. Am I making any sense? So that it's it's not either or. It may very well be the career tech, high quality career tech, that's forward with rigorous academics, that kids will see the need for algebra and geometry, reading difficult text, taking a physics course, chemistry course. That may be very well the need. So one of the things one can begin to think about is purposely designing some pathways. That yes, you can get off at the end of high school. But every pathway ought to be designed to some extent if you can go on to that next level. And uh, right now, uh, I looked at one of your high schools, one of your districts, and I will not name the district. I looked at the data on seniors who had taken Kirk Tech. What I really found out of that 511 students, only about 10 had taken a college ready cohort. Secondly, what I found was only about 310 had taken at least three courses in a planned pathway in CTE. The others kind of grazed their way through high school. They took a CT course over here, another one over here. They took the lowest level academic <coughs> pathway through. But guess what? 60% were planning to go to four-year colleges. Only about 20% planned to go to community colleges. So that, that has to shift. And I think the question you have to get to think about, what kind of accountability system that calls a change in behavior that we begin to teach two thirds of our kids in that deep end swimming pool? Yes. You, I think you hit my concern right there at the end is what can you do to change the behavior uh, and to create that career path mindset because I talk to people, a lot of politicians, a lot of people out on the street that think uh, a career path is like shop used to be back in the old days and does not require the uh, math and science and the STEM courses. It does. So how do we how do we change that mindset uh, in the public and among the people who, who set the uh, curriculum and that sort of thing in education? move in that direction. Uh, I, I think there's some movement there, but I, I think that a lot of people are afraid to stick their toe in the deep end of that boat. <laughs> well, let me make a couple of statements there. I've been about high school reform now for 30 years, my second career. And there's one lesson I've learned. We way underestimate what our kids can do. They're far more capable. They're just bored in many cases in high school. And they're not challenged. And uh, so yes, well, I'll give you an example. Um, in 2010, we had a report from a commission chaired by Governor Purdue of Georgia, a different Purdue, North Carolina Purdue. But one of the conclusions in that report was this. If we're serious about having 65 to 70 percent of our students ready for post-secondary studies. We're going to have to think about some optional pathway through high school, one that's intellectually demanding but linked to a college-ready core. From that effort, we launched out in partnership with eight states to develop some new kinds of current technical studies, build around projects, intellectually demanding, but every project requires you to have to read the technical materials. They're built around the seven steps of engineering, ways of thinking. Every project's got a math component. You have to come up with a design. You have to make an oral presentation. You have to put that as well. I think that's, that might be my code ring back there. Uh, I'll call back. The illustration I want to give you is this. We 
we've just looked at almost a thousand students who took our end of course exams. We have about 130 students now adopted these courses. 88% said the assignments in those courses were rigorous. Secondly, when we compared that to students who take typical high school CTE studies today, it's about 30% who say their challenges are rigorous. We have to think about new assignments in CTE courses that are much more intellectually demanding. Now, here's what te has surprised teachers. We've all had these examples. But I've interviewed three teachers recently in three different fields, and they all said the same thing before. I have never experienced kids wanting to come to class early and stay late to complete their assignment. They own the work. They have to think it through. They have to own it. They even fail sometimes. They say they learn more about failing than they do about passing. But one, one example is a senior year. You know how we, if you're a senior, you get out the last two weeks of school, you'll do your thing. He said, I've never had this experience before. He's a former ag teacher. He said, I've never had seniors <coughs> come back and take the last two weeks of school to finish the project they were working on. So we have to rethink what high school career technical education looks like it's got to be intellectually demanding. It's got to stretch kids out. It has to require a productive struggle. When you do that, it will have, you will have kids taking AP when you come down and take a class. You'll have set beside a kid who's still trying to struggle to pass algebra one in high school. But they all begin to learn together. It's a mix of folks. So it can be done. There's a shift. The second thing, that's a long answer to your first question, because you gave me a chance to get in a good commercial there. Courses, I'll share those with you. You have to materials about those courses there. But the other thing, when I looked over your system, I didn't see anything in your accountability system that you're sending a message to school boards and the superintendents and the principals in which you value high quality current technical studies the same way as you value high quality academic studies. So I think one of the things you have to do is in your accountability system. What does it mean to be, what, what, how would you help to shift that system for all of a sudden the school board member to be concerned about the quality of the current technical? It's not a place for somebody else's kid. It may be a place for my grandchildren to tie. I've got a grandson right now going to a special school so he can get an aviation course and he's tying all his academics around him because that's what he's interested in. So you're going to find that once you make it a quality and begin to build it in your accountability system, not that you do not have quality programs now, you do. There are some programs in that school that district I was talking about. There are a few kids really being stretched out in their career classes, but most are not being. And that's the challenge you have. Other questions from the media at this point? Uh, I have one gene that refers to the chart we were looking at uh, just a bit ago. Uh, as I understand the chart, it's sort of reflecting the uh, match between what we are teaching or training or where kids are enrolled in secondary and post-secondary and where we predict the job needs are. With the economy changing as rapidly as it does, uh, and with the idea that we're trying to, I think you're suggesting maybe there is a misalignment or a failure to align some of the career pathways with what the needs are. If we try to align things with this, uh, how quickly are these numbers or needs likely to change? How do you deal with that change so that you don't just create a new point in time where you say, okay, we now got career pathways to boost our architecture, construction, business management, administration, finance, and health science, and then in three and a half years, we find ourselves way out of kilter again. How, how do you deal with that? Okay, you will get out of kilter again in the future. Things will change. The nature of those jobs will change. Um, but today, you have this situation. I, I flipped on the TV last night uh, and uh, a person was talking about the plight of the American male and their high unemployment rate. 
Um, we have a lot of people unemployed today because they did not get the foundational skills to continue to learn. So if you build the kind of pathways I'm talking about, you're going to leave people with the those foundational skills that they can begin to adopt to that workplace. That's going to be key. The other thing um, to do, um, there are three states that have set up some funding incentives. Um, one of the reasons you have declining enrollment, declining students in some of those programs are more expensive to put in. It's a lot easier to put in a law enforcement program. Less costly, probably putting in some of the manufacturing programs. Uh, Delaware set aside, they, they looked at this kind of data, and they set up a dollar amount that uh, would only go to build pathways between high schools and community college. They put up a million dollars. Now for Delaware, that's like one of your counties. So they were trying to make that kind of shift. Uh, West Virginia, uh, for the last five or six years has set up a half a million dollars a year for their schools to put in the advanced career curriculum that I was talking about. Because they're trying to make that shift. Uh, the, uh, another state, I'm trying to remember which one right now, actually earmarked a portion of the Perkins money, high school and community college did, to create new structured pathways in some of these critical areas to tie the two together. Some way, if you want folks to change, and in your accountability system, do you have something in the accountability system that says that if a student completes a college pathway preparatory and a career focused pathway in a high demand field, that that student will get more points for that high school than one who just kind of wanders their way through? So, how do you send a signal that building Rigorous pathways tied to solid academic studies is important. Funding is going to be one part of it. The other part of it is getting people to reshift funding and accountability. It would be one might want to study the Kentucky accountability system. Because you ask the question, how do you get folks to change? Uh, for, for most states are having a declining enrollment in career studies in high school, they're having a rising enrollment. And they've seen a rise. They have about 30% of their students who finish four courses. They have a four-course system in career and technical studies who are also meeting the college ready standards for college. And then they have an academic ready standards. If you give work keys, you can begin to use that. If you meet the silver level on work keys, which 67% of the jobs that make up that database, you'd, be, you'd have a literacy and math skills for. They have gradually pushed that up to a very low level, so they have a, about 67% of their courses now meeting either academic requirements for work keys or college ready requirements. And they're working to drive that on up. But those are the kind of signals you have to send. That begins to say to that superintendent, to the high school counselor, president, quality career tech coupled with quality academics. One of the problems is that career tech kids are getting the lowest level academics, most boring. And uh, you, you have to begin to teach that differently, and we can talk more about that. Okay. Go ahead with your thing. That's it. No questions for now. No, I think I'll just about give most of my speech. You know. So I give you the symbol I was looking at here. That's the kind of situation, the metaphor you can take away. Um, what's the problem? We still have too many students stuck in the shallow end of the swimming pool of learning. And too few stuck in the deep end. Not the depth of the ship. You've got to begin to move 65 to 70 to 75 percent into that deep end of learning. And uh, I think I've talked about that. And uh, that means new kinds of pathways tied in with very solid academics. But it means kind of accountability system. Now, here's some data. Uh, uh, if you look at your NATE scores coming out of grade 8, you have, like everybody else, about 30 to 40 percent of your students coming out of grade 8 who are reading and doing math at the proficient level. 
that's kind of, it's right at that proficient level of name is whether or not you're on track to be college ready or post-secondary ready. That has to be lifted up. Middle grade schools have to accelerate learning a great deal in literacy and math. Have you ever thought about why reading achievement in the American high school declines after age four, grade four? The longer you stay in school, the wider the gap between grade level and students' ability to read. Who does reading belong to in our middle grade schools and high schools? Huh? What do you mean belong to? Which teacher? English. English. But should you have to read in biology class to read that difficult textbook? Yeah. What about the social studies class? Rather than just telling great stories, would one want to read the, that text? What about the career tech class? <coughs> Sixth grade teacher gave an assignment in one of the North Carolina schools in reading. The kids actually designed and built a solar oven. But they had to go and read a difficult text. She worked with them on that text way over their head until reading becomes a tool for learning in every class, we'll never close the literacy gap. It's not to make every teacher a teacher reading, it is to shift assignments in such a way that in order to do your assignment, you have to read grade level text. You say, well, they read two grades below. Listen, I read way below when I hit college. I struggled way through. Kids can read difficult text, but they'll have to have some special instruction to help. Literacy is probably one of the most foundational career skills you can, you can talk about. So that's part of the shift here that one has to make. So that, and math gets to be very key as well. So middle grade schools, one accountability systems has to be what percent of students, increase the percent of students coming out of grade eight who can enroll in real algebra one, who can take the real English class that counts, who can take the real biology class and engage you in reading the textbook. Until we begin to reduce the percent of kids placed in those lower level classes in high school, that means one accountability for middle school is they have to send you students who can begin to read challenging texts and, and do the math. Am I making any sense? That's a different kind of accountability. I'm to get a thing like because high schools are greatly linked to their, their middle schools. Now, when you look at STEM in your state, uh, these are the percent of students in STEM interested seniors who met ACT college readiness benchmarks in North Carolina by race and groups. And you can see the numbers there. I understand they're about to raise those benchmarks on STEM. Uh, uh, and I never could quite figure out the number of students that uh, had an interest in STEM so I could make sense out of this between the time I had I couldn't get that figured out. But that, as you look at that STEM category, now here's your students who begin to meet college ACT college ready standards in your state. You get 100% so yours is going to be lower than other people. Uh, but if you use that as a benchmark, now that 26% in science, that is driven largely by their ability to read the items on that exam. It's not a measure of knowledge. You have a lot of passages on that ACT exam where you have to read tech, very scientific materials and answer questions. And if you're not engaged in reading physics texts, chemistry texts, biology texts, you're not going to enter high school, you're not going to be able to do. And you're going to hit that first course in college, you think you want to be a pharmacist, you get that organic chemistry with 300 students in class, you got to read that difficult text, you're not used to doing that, what's going to happen? They're going to choose another major. I had a grandson who did that. I can tell you. Uh, now, look at the unemployment rate. I look at some states here. North Carolina's number E. I never could get the data that I felt comfortable with on the last point. The state A has a 10% youth unemployment of under age 25. What's unique about that state? They probably have the strongest secondary current technical system in the nation, best funded, the 
highest percent of their young graduates with a credential. We have some very solid credentials that kids get. State B is another state with three urban areas, system of current technical centers, comprehensive high schools. They have a 13% unemployment. All workers are five. They have a 15% adult post-secondary certified. State C and D are very similar to North Carolina. Uh, you can begin to see the percent of folks who are unemployed under age 25. If I go to the minority population in your state and C and D, African Americans in particular, you go begin to look at 20 to 25 percent of young folks under 25 unemployed. And that is in terms of we're going to face a situation where we have jobs, but people do not have the skill sets for them. And uh, that's the challenge that we'll face. The, uh, if I look at your unemployment rate of adults, you can again see where you stand there and I'll move. The takeaway from me is this. Unless you reduce the flow of students who fail to earn a credible credential, the Florida certification exam, bachelor's degree, associate degree by age 25, with the rising workplace requirements, these rates will continue to rise on you. That's the challenge that we all face um, across the nation. Education attainment varies by race, ethnicity, and uh, this this would surprise me. It would it could very well fit my own state of Georgia. Uh, we have never produced enough BS degree graduates to fill the demand. Uh, I was surprised that of the folks who, who born outside the state who are foreign born, they have a higher percent how a uh, whites and blacks and Asians have a higher percent of a BS degree. So you have, like Georgia, you have uh, benefited from importing people in, in this case, our folks in to work. This is true for all fields except Hispanics. Uh, uh, we've been <coughs> benefited in Georgia for folks. You didn't have to pay for their education. But what you're left with is not developing enough your own people for those jobs. Uh, and, and that's the rise of workplace requirement we have. I'm going to move over some of these. I think those points are made now. This, this data here, somebody will be very familiar with this data. We looked at the Office of Education data. This is the data that the community colleges and your department shares with the uh, with uh, Office of Education. And this is the average kind of percentages across 2007, 08, 2014, 15 in terms of enrollment that right one up there. Enrollment, uh, blue is post-secondary, and, uh, and the red is, uh, is the high school. And what you see from the data, there, there's a need for structural pathways beginning in high school. The person who did this analysis Included, there's not a lot of connection between pathways in high school and post secondary. You can see post secondary really going out in the health field. Um, but what surprised me, what do you think, what career field has the highest percent of students enrolled in at the high school level? of enrollment is in one single field. And maybe the economy demands that, and that's that's critical. I'll leave that. Is national or North Carolina? North Carolina. Uh, Takeaway overall, there's a little relationship between patterns of CT concentration in high school or two-year 
we buy in the concept of structured career pathway beginning high school. If you're going to get an advanced credential that's going to move you into higher wage job, it's going to take time to do that at the post-secondary level, either an advanced credential program, or associate degree, or applied degree program. And uh, you can see that mix here in that particular slide. Uh, so why too many students are heading for the shallow end of the swimming pool? Why? And what, uh, what can we do about that? I want to show you three slides that further builds on our conversation earlier. This is data on 2009 students and uh, from 944 high schools in America, 23,000 students. This is kind of a representative sample. And uh, just to show that when you looked at this data, 8% of the students finished a career focused and a college pathway. Only 31% of the students uh, were career ready, uh, college ready, 31% were college ready, 13% were career ready, meaning they had finished three courses in a sequence, as opposed to taking one over here and one over here, if you follow me. 47% had finished no cohesive curriculum. They had not taken a solid academic core. They had, they had dabbled here and there in career courses, but had not taken a focus. Now, when you look at the results, what they were planning to do, those who had a career college and career focus, 77% planned to go into a bachelor's degree or higher. 17%, 11% planned to go as a social degree. Those who were college ready, they were 78 and 12. Just career ready is 52% plan to go on, 22% plan to go with the community colleges, and uh, no cohesive curriculum. You still had 61% of the students who plan to go to a bachelor's degree. Now, you have a high percentage of students entering college, but many of them are not prepared, and they're not, they're not prepared to stay, they're not prepared to make it out. Now, one other data, I just wanted to share a couple others. There may be questions at this point in time. Uh, the, uh, this is a group of high schools and work sites in 2014. 15% of the students in that school completed uh, a concentration in an academic college ready court. 15% did. You can see the percent met the college ready standards of reading, math, and science, 81, 81, and 78. You can see the percent with post-secondary aspirations, 72 to 19. And then you college ready core. Then you had a group of students who finished 14 percent, finished the college ready core, and, and a weak career pathway. Now, the difference between a weak career pathway is the assignment students were given. Students in the first column perceived they had very records assignments with a common set of indicators that we use for that. And the second one, they did not. And uh, you can see the percent who met. The point to take away here is this. 64% met the reading standard, 64 in uh, math, 62 in science. You get about a 15-point jump in readiness for college if students have rigorous assignments in their CTE classroom. There is an academic value added, but you have to use your academics to do real work with it. Does that make any sense? And, and we also do not think about quality career technical program having that kind of value added. Now, the last slide, they had weak academics and a weak career pathway. Look at the percent, how that fell down. The below 50% met the red standards for college. But yet, you still have a high percent plan to go on for post-secondary studies. The aspiration, there's nothing wrong with the aspirations of American youth. They want to go on to post-secondary. The challenge is they're not enrolled in the right courses to get there. Now this slide here is the slide uh, about the school district I was talking about in your state. Uh, this is 511 students. Uh, you can see 2% or 10 students who they said were career oriented, but they were, we couldn't find any evidence they had taken career courses, uh, but had finished a, uh, 
a collagenic core without CTE concentration. About 78 percent planted support post-secondary studies. Uh, masters are greater, higher, and uh, non planted go. And CT concentration without a collagenic core. These are 162 students who had a concentration but did not take the complete collagenic core. You can see their goals, and then you had no collagenic core. RCG concentration. The largest group of students out of the 511 had no focus in high school, either academic or career. Now that's that's a very weak counseling system. It, it, it's a high school that's unfocused. I've discovered over the years when you get a high school to focus, everybody's going to have a goal. There's going to be a solid program of studies. Graduation rates go up. Achievement goes up. But this is truly the current high school that we talked about in the late 60s. It's, it's kids kind of meander their way through. Am I making any sense to you guys? But what kind of building system will begin to bring refocus to that? Because I can tell you it's a pattern nationwide as you can see the first group. It's not unique in North Carolina. I know you got a question. You have probably no, no, I don't have a question. You, I was uh, encouraging you to move to on. the end. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to the end fast. Let me move it quickly. But I don't want you to leave out the critical stuff. Okay. <laughs> it's all critical because I've, I've still got four more points on that checklist you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> come back. Road to the middle class. I'm going to get over to that part and get down to that one. Uh, you have to increase greatly the college and career readiness of high school graduates. And that literally means making major investments in teachers to learn how to formulate literacy-based assignments, whether you're a vocational teacher or a science teacher. It will take time. It's not easy. It cannot be done one afternoon after school. And you're going to have to reach how to help them. Drill sheet math will not get you there, and that's what many of these kids get who are at CT and others. We teach more math than ever taught, but the achievement have not, has not shown it. Means of teaching math in a much different way. I can give you a long submission on that one. It also means creating career pathways that span high school and post secondary, allow the good career opportunities combined with a college ready core. I'm going to quickly hit for you something we call advanced careers. I'm going to move through fast. I checked on this, some of your critical industries that came from your format here. I'm not, these are new courses we developed, all will be completed by the end of this year. And uh, they're each built around these seven steps of learning, seven steps of engineering. They're STEM-like in nature. And uh, they're designed to prepare students for double purpose. Uh, integrated production technology, advanced manufacturing. If you call something manufacturing high school, very few students enroll in it. And uh, you can see the, and I'm in your folder, we have given you a title of all the projects they go through and the essential questions. And I've given you a sheet if you want to go online, you can actually look at some of the projects. You'll see they're blend. So I'm going to move quickly through these. Clean energy is one of your topics here. You have a whole line of priorities in that area. I was driving through Robeson County the other day, and there was a solar farm right outside the city limits there. Uh, advanced current energy and power, grid. Four portion needs in these areas. Aeronautics and Aviation. We have two schools in the state that have adopted the Aeronautics and Aviation curriculum. One's in Union County, one's over on the coast. Um, advanced career business informatics is to kind of analyze the business data. Uh, innovation in science and technology tends to fit the first of all high schools. I'll just leave you what you do to say about it. And uh, what 88% said. Of course, the size of the rigorous, that compares about the position. Now, it's, these projects represent a blend of these kind of skills. And uh, so let me get to the last point of this. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. You all have early college, and you've got good knowledge out of it. How about an early senior year? What about students who already meet the literacy math readiness to 
go to community college or someplace or go full time. So if you want more kids to have a best credential, you're gonna have to get more time. Or how do you so allow up to earn it's possible to earn 30 semester hours for those who already have those literacy and math ready scales? How do you bid, blend, college ready core and career studies? How do you retain the senior? How do you make that a blend between high school and others? So how do you personalize the design for earning the mass credential? And uh, that's one kind of issue I would raise with you. Give accountability points for students to complete a true college preparatory courses in grade nine. More for every student who comes to grade nine ready and succeed in a challenging curriculum. Not the second tier curriculum or the third tier, but the challenging curriculum. Give a point for students who complete a true college ready core and at least four quality courses in career pathway program of studies. Meet college readiness in literacy or math. I was offering you the Kentucky one to study. Uh, meet, uh, meet technical readiness by acquiring credential or passing in the course exams with enough up to carry college credit. Earn 30 semester hours of college credit in advance that senior year. The uh, adopting new curve pathways. Washington, D.C., we were in there this week. We were shocked that all of their Perkins Fund goes to creating new pathways to line the labor market. <coughs> if you want to keep the old one, you pay for it. They made that shift in that district. I already mentioned what Delaware and West Virginia has done. Tennessee is a study. <coughs> they have really gone to redesign their existing CTE programs to make those more records, the traditional programs. They have done a lot of course redesign, cut back on a lot of courses. Uh, Georgia has a move on when ready, the senior year, in which the state is paying both the college and the high school for those students who have literacy foundation scales to get more kids in because in that state much of their technical their heavy technical programs are in those technical colleges uh, i'm going to take this moment on this one to be with it. i'm not you have uh, you have set some register goals but i want you to look at uh, kind of a simple way that is, that is getting some attention in kentucky is shifting behavior at the school building level for every student means college ready, either by ACT or COMPASS, or a state <coughs> golf exam, that school gets one point. Every student who is career ready, who meets academic career ready, and Joanne may use silver on the work keys to do that, and then R, they can use ASVAB, instead of cut score on ASVAB, the military exam, and they've either passed a state developed industry exam, they developed our industry certification exam that they really have been vetting down. They get one point for that. And it's interesting how the quality of their CT programs began to change out there. Then if you meet both college ready and career ready, every student is 1.5. What does that begin to say that about the school board? You have former school board member you. What's going to say that high school principal? If I have kids combining a college ready core with quality CTE, they can be both of them. What does the point or the 1.5 translate into? Is it just a, a ranking or a rating, or is there something tangible? It, it translates into kind of a scorekeeping system. On the school? On the school, and, and, the, and the, for the district. It's a, and it's, they tell stories about how it's called superintendents and school boards and principals to rethink. Even counselors to begin to rethink about students taking the right courses in high school. Um, now that's their shift in college that occurred. These are students who are now in college and technical ready, 33%. You can see the progression over a period of time. That means they've met the ACT cut scores or the ASVAB, <coughs> not the ASVAB, but their placement exams. And then that's percent who met their career rating. And they still have. Academic and technical career rating only, about 21%. So they 
pushing that one on that. The, uh, I've already talked about so too. Now, if you have about 130 credentials, many of these credentials are very valuable, but in looking at those credentials in terms of <coughs> truly representing an end of program exam, and uh, Yes, you ought to have credentials for, uh, for first aid, but that's not an industry credential. CPR is not an industry credential. Uh, work keys measures the academic readiness. It's not a technical readiness measure. So as you continue to think through your credential area, uh, if you can bundle together some of those course exams that are used, and you have to pass at least three of those course exams, that begins to become a program way of measuring. So when you begin to look at the credentials you have, you have the potential of really focusing up your pathways by sharpening up your credentials. Now, the individual credentials certainly have value, but they do not represent what SREB in their 21st century and our credentials are all important to get the outline. Low performing skills is a challenge for you in many districts. And uh, we'll talk more about that one. Summary, you thought I'd never get here. Uh, until we rethink through assignments, the Yarmouth know, daily lesson plans, assignments that are lecture depending, it's going to take several days to complete, it's going to engage kids in deep learning, you're not going to get there. Establishing the accountability system that values both college and career readiness equally. SRAB CT Commission Report as a framework for redesign low department high school, which is laid out. A copy of that report is in your folder. Every low department high school is that we can become organized around career academies, career pathways, tie all this together, it works. Achievement goes up. A lot of more high schools in both secondary and high band and high paying career fields. Yes, there's some of those fields that you're going to continue to fire far that will not be high paying probably are stuck too much on one end now. Redesign the city here to allow parachutes to earn best credentials. And uh, so I'm back to swimming pool analysis. What what will happen, what can you do that causes change to make that 65 to 70 percent in deep learning as opposed to just 40? Uh, question for the committee, Representative Horn. First question is: Are these? Is this presentation available? This PowerPoint available to us? Do you have it printed out, or is it access on the website? Or you I'm have a that. you have a paper in your folder that lays out much of this. Uh, it's got I, I found that, but much is not all. So they're going to uh, add it on the website. Great. That, that satisfies my uh, yeah, because I found some edits fast. in my notes this morning that need to be worked on, but uh, if you'll overlook those edits, it's there. I think most of the PowerPoints are correct. We finished up about 6.30 yesterday, and uh, so you have that. Right. Now, yeah. maybe a little more sophisticated question, or at least a sophisticated type of thing, which puts severe limits.
what we read, which is much more than just a work manual or an instruction book or um, some deep thinking on chemical engineering, but what we read in great books, appreciation of form, which leads to architecture, etc. Where so where does that fit? All are good questions. Uh, we've got a pretty good sense of where the job market is going in, in some ways. It's going, the requirements are going to continue to rise, and you're going to have to continue to adjust and learn in that place. So one of the biggest skills you can leave with is folks having the ability to continue to learn and adapt. And uh, students do learn differently. There are students that if you take on more of a project-based approach to learning that requires them to have to use their academic skills to complete, they're going to discover the need for those academic skills. So one of the keys is to, to me, I've always seen high quality career and technical studies with blending with academics, a different way of learning. A different way of learning. And um, the balance of all things, yes, Students ought to read the great literature. They ought to know something about art and music. Uh, uh, and uh, but if you were to go into a literature class, I've been in many of them, and you're in that third tier, you never read the materials. You would lecture about it, but you're never engaged in the reading process. Uh, and you have to think about the things that interest boys. I, I tell you, a Shakespeare teacher in Arkansas, how she used a new literacy approach. Taught ninth grade Shakespeare. Well, uh, she created an assignment when they had to read Romeo and Juliet. And uh, when reading Romeo and Juliet, they had to read some related materials about making good decisions. Of course, Romeo and Juliet teenagers about ninth grade age. She said she had never had kids so engaged in that reading. They had to come together and had to write a paper. And the question was, was Romeo and Juliet capable of making, were they mature enough to make a good decision? What could they have done differently? So that really paid off. Another teacher of literature, Macbeth, taught this, taught this literature at a Career Tech Center. And, uh, okay, she had in her class health occupation students. She had construction trade kids. She had others. She said, okay, now you guys in the construction trade, I want you to read Macbeth, and I want you to design the props that would take to do a Backed out, <coughs> back Beth. What happened? They got into it. They're ready. To the health occupations kids, she gave an assignment. Now you read this, and then here's the publication on mental health. The central question is is this guy crazy or not? You take a stand and present your evidence. What happened? I've seen that happen over and over. So that's, yes, there are the kids ought to read. What bothers me is if you go into the basic English class or even the general English class in high school, those kids are not engaged in reading that material. But you can't hook them into it. I can take you to five high schools in South Manette, Georgia, as the superintendent like to say, the inner city move to the suburbs. And uh, when they organized 25 other student high schools five themes and the teachers all plan together they tie the career and the academics together attendance going up graduation rates going up achievements going up kids engagements going up so I it's, you've got to, you have to tie these two worlds together it can't work but you have to learn to vision somewhere you have to have a vision of a high school that prepares for double purpose 
guy wrote a book in New York City, the Princeton New York City High School in 1953. He wrote a book, he described 10 high schools in America that are used both for further study and a career. They tied it together. This is an old idea, but it's not one that most of our high schools are built on. I want to interject a comment to, to maybe be sure I I understand what you're suggesting as it relates to what President Moore was asking about. My sense of a lot of what you said is that um, as a major part of preparing kids to be college or career ready, whether they're in CTE or a pure college track, they all need the deep end of learning on literacy and math, and that that is the piece, maybe more than others, that prepares them to be adaptable when the career changes come in the future, the job that they may have thought they were preparing for goes away and there's something else. But if you can read at a, a good level, if you can do math at a good level, you've got to be adaptable. Is that fair? That's fair. One point I would add to that, for some students, you may, you probably cannot engage them in that deeper reading until you get them involved in something they have an interest in. That's where the career comes in. That's where the project-based learning. Every kid has to go read very difficult materials. Now, secondly, is the area of focus. Uh, what do you do to encourage students to have a focus in STEM? science about AP focus or humanities focus. So I would certainly believe the great high school, every kid, if you have a kid with a focus, a burn, things will begin to come together. But we have too few students, in high, we have too many high schools grazing students, grazing their way through high school without a focus. Quality career tech can do that. Deep study AP can do that for other kids. Does that make you feel what I'm saying? Think about your own kids. Else? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bottoms is going to be here this afternoon. We're going to have a panel discussion right now. Uh, you all can sort of mentally stretch, if you will, where you are. We're going to move on. Uh, Joanne Honeycutt, uh, Catherine Moga Bryant, and Jackie Keener. Uh, if you all want to come up, uh, do you all have uh, slides that we need? You need to come up here so you can access the clicker. If you do, uh, Joanne, you want to come up first? Joanne is uh, Director of Career and Technical Education at DPI, and uh, you all may be aware that the legislature, I think a couple of years ago, started paying for some of the cert national business certification exams for students in the CTE programs uh, to take. And in addition, uh, we in the budget that is now in effect for the first time, we've also provided some uh, bonus money to go to teachers of students who are successful in passing the national business certification exams. And so I think Joanne and then Catherine Moga Bryant from the Department of Commerce uh, Division of Workforce Solutions are going to talk to us along with Jackie from the Department of Commerce who's Labor and Economic Analysis Division. And the concept is how are we meshing together the jobs that are out there with what we are uh, paying for because we didn't have enough money to pay for all national business certifications. So we asked Commerce and DPI to work together to identify what we ought to pay for, give them the authority as I understand it to regionalize or specify, do it differently in different areas of the state based on business needs, job needs, and that sort of thing. So we've asked them to come and tell us how that is shaping up, what has happened with respect to what we've been paying for, how we've identified what we're paying for, and what the plan at this point is on how the uh, bonus programs are going to be identified uh, and as to which one we'll pay for. So, uh, Joanne? You're going to get first. Okay. Uh, 
good morning, uh, members. I'm Catherine Moga Bryant. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Division of Workforce Solutions with the Department of Commerce. And I'm actually going to talk um, high level, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues, Joanne Honeycutt and Jackie Keener, to talk about some more um, specifics here. So first, I'd like to talk about um, the state's workforce goal. Last October, North Carolina passed a, um, a new goal for workforce that 67% of working adults will have education and training beyond high school by 2025. And this goal was uh, developed based on some research that was done by the Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce that identified that 67% of jobs are going to require some form of education beyond high school. And so what does that mean beyond high school? It could be an industry recognized credential, which we've been talking about uh, this morning and we'll be talking about more in a, in a few minutes. It could be a, a certificate or a diploma through the community college system or the university system. It could be a degree offered through one of our higher education institutions. Uh, but the, the, the big goal is, is understanding that a high school degree is no longer enough to get um, good quality jobs. And one of our key strategies for ensuring that we have uh, not just students with any degree, but that we have students that are filling the, uh, the needs of our employers is our NC Work Certified Career Pathways. And these, this pathway is a key initiative to make sure that we are developing a sustainable talent pipeline to meet the needs of employers. And we've set out eight criteria uh, that are required in order to have a certified career pathway. And I'll just go through each of the eight quickly um, so that you can understand kind of how this all works. And, and a career pathway is a clear plan that identifies the uh, knowledge, skills, abilities, uh, education, experience, um, credentials that an, an individual would need in order to be qualified for an occupation. And what we've done in North Carolina is we've expanded this beyond uh, K-12 and college system so that these pathways can be used by anybody in North Carolina. They can be used for um, job seekers, for veterans, uh, for people with disabilities. It is the same set of knowledge, skills, and abilities that's required by an occupation. And so the first criteria is that these career pathways have to be based on demand driven and data, and data informed. That means they have to be an in-demand occupation. And there has to be a, uh, some data that's used to identify what those occupations are. Because we want to make sure that we're targeting our resources and our activities and our funding uh, towards those careers that are most uh, in need of skilled workers. The second criteria is that you have to have an engaged group of employers. Now we ask these employers to come together, not just one or two, but a group of employers from an industry to come together and meet with educators and workforce professionals to tell us what are those knowledge, skills, and abilities that that industry needs um, in order for people to be successful in those occupations. We ask what credentials, what specific industry recognized credentials are needed. And we ask what kind of experiences we want, um, they want individuals to have. And all this information is then used by educators and workforce professionals to put together a clear plan that meets the needs of those employers. The third criteria is that these pathways have to be collaborative. So I've already talked about education and workforce professionals. We require K-12, community college, university, and our workforce boards at a minimum be involved in the development of these pathways. We know that so many of our students and job seekers don't touch just one part of our system, but they touch multiple parts of our system. They go from K-12 to community college, Community college to university, maybe university or community college back to a career center, they need to be getting the same information from all of our education and workforce partners so they don't have to start over each time they enter a new institution. There needs to be a career awareness component. We reach down into the middle schools to make sure that there's information being provided about these careers and occupations at an early enough point where people can actually use that information to make decisions about their high school um, time and into community college. There have to be articulation and coordination agreements between our educational institutions, again K-12, community colleges and university, so that it's easy to transfer those um, skills and classes and courses that they've already taken. One of the key um, factors about a career pathway is that we don't want people to have to start at zero every time they change in 
institutions. So if they've done the work in high school, they should be able to move on to the next step and not have to go back to point A. Every career pathway has got to include work-based learning. When we meet with our employers, we ask them to uh, commit to providing some kind of work-based learning opportunity for the students in those pathways. Uh, there's a wide variety of uh, ways that an employer can do that. Um, but that we found that uh, one of the biggest reasons why students are not uh, qualified for jobs is they don't have experience. And work-based learning gives those students uh, the experience of having a job and the experience in that specific industry. Career pathways also have to have multiple points of entry and exit. We know not everybody's uh, pathway is straight. It may take some turns. Somebody may have to stop out of their educational um, attainment to uh, get a job, to um, support their family. Uh, they may go into the military, but we need to make sure it's easy for them to come back on where they left off and again, not stop back, start back at point A. And finally, they have to identify an evaluation strategy to determine if this pathway is actually working. Are they getting students in? Are those students prepared for those uh, occupations? And are those businesses hiring those students? And finally, are we meeting the needs of the employers? That's the biggest goal, is to make sure that we have that sustainable talent pipeline to meet the needs of employers in North Carolina. Uh, Chair, uh, if it's okay, I'll turn it over to Joanne Honeycutt to talk about credentials. Let me see, let's see. anybody have any questions for uh, Catherine at this point? I am Joanne Honeycutt and I serve as the Director for Career and Technical Education um, at the Department of Public Instruction. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes giving a little bit of background about why we're in the business and having conversations about um, industry credentials in the K-12 space. And so to do that, we need to back up about 10 years um, to the last reauthorization of the federal Perkins grant. Um, it was the first time in the federal career tech legislation that there was mention of industry recognized credentials as a way to validate the technical attainment, which is one of our measures for our high school students. Um, in North Carolina's plan for that new Perkins, we were deliberate about considering industry credentials um, for our students, both because we thought it was um, a very good thing, a, a very good um, transferable credential for them to take with them, but also as a way for us to think about how we design our CTE courses um, and allow students to have the benefit of a strong foundation within a cluster and within an industry. So we, we went about that work. Um, our processes were um, revised to ensure that we included business and industry in our course standards development, specifically asking the question, as Catherine mentioned, are there industry recognized credentials that validate the skills and knowledge that you want your workers to have? Whether that's for an entry level position or an advanced position, we wanted to know how we could design our courses to meet that need. Over time, we have expanded the number of credentials that we consider in alignment with our courses. Um, each year, the department produces a credentials by course listing. Um, we go through a process to evaluate credentials that we're asked to consider. Uh, we want to make sure that those credentials are criteria referenced and that they're either endorsed by or developed in partnership with business and industry um, folks that would indicate that they have a value. We publish that list and, and schools can then choose what of the courses and pathways um, they wish to offer and also which credentials students will be um, consequently prepared for. Um, I'll be the first to tell you that there is a varying degree of value for credentials, even the ones that we are currently collecting. Um, some are far more rigorous than others. Um, some of the credentials that we list in our report are actually credentials um, that come from other state agencies like the Office of State Fire Marshal or Emergency um, Management Systems. Um, what we found in this work in the past few years is that as credentials have become um, more visible, that lots of folks are in the business now of selling credentials. And so we've been careful to make sure that um, we've not um, over included folks who were just trying to sell a test 
to our schools and to our students. We really have tried to hold tight to that value. Um, unlike the uh, ONET information, there's not a national clearinghouse that says, if you want to be an accountant, here are the five industry credentials that you need. Right? You want to be an accountant, ONET says you need a bachelor's degree in accounting and you need to be certified by your state body. So as we ask the question about which ones are the best, which ones best align with occupations, there's not a national source to go to and say, here is the answer. So as we have interjected um, this credential work with Career Pathways, we've been purposeful about allowing regions and local education agencies and counties look at what their employers are saying locally are, are these credentials. And so we develop pathways and support that that include uh, stackable credentials. We don't expect students in high school um, to know exactly what they want to do forever, um, nor do we think that the jobs today, to your question early, earlier representative form, will be the jobs that will be there forever. And so our pathways at the secondary level in particular have been designed to give students a foundational knowledge around the knowledge and skills and abilities in a particular career cluster. And where there are industry credentials that they can stack and attain in high school, we certainly want them to leave with those, um, both because it prepares them for entry level positions quickly, um, but also because of the body of research that talks about once a student earns a credential, they're more likely to continue to earn credentials and we, help, we think that helps them um, along their path. At every step of the way in developing career pathways, we are working with our workforce partners, um, the community college system, and our uh, colleagues at the Department of Commerce, and we're modeling that for the local education agencies um, as well. When we talk to practitioners about creating career pathways, we talk to them explicitly about designing academic and technical content that supports the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they demand from employers. So we talk about a core um, of academics that leads them to success and many choices. Um, and we talk about technical skills that are purposeful and designed for um, achievement as they move forward. School systems, as I mentioned, um, do utilize the funds that were um, budgeted and provided by this body to assist students in paying for credentials. Um, as Representative Blackwell noted, um, while we're very appreciative of those dollars, we also know that um, it's not enough dollars to pay for every student in a course that has an aligned credential to take the test. And so there are choices that are made at the local level about how many students, which students, and which exams um, they will participate in. The chart here shows you the growth we've had in credentials over time. North Carolina is one of the few states in the nation that even attempts to collect credential data at the secondary level. Um, and so it's, it's pretty impressive that we have data at all to share. Uh, but you can see it's been a dramatic increase from just about 25,000 in the first year. We started collecting 130,000 in the 14, 15 academic year. And while the numbers aren't final, we're saying around 150,000, 149,000 for this past year. So we believe that the growth is attributed to a number of factors. One was the removal of the fee barrier. Um, many students who were not able to pay for these prior to um, the funding um, now have access to them. We think that we're doing a better job aligning our CTE coursework with the standards of these industry credentials, and that's also proving and then the third reason is that we've had some really concerted and purposeful professional development for teachers. Um, we've really bought into the mantra that teachers need to be one to teach one, and so we've continued to develop our teachers in that way. We do collect this data from a number of authoritative sources, um, but we don't have authoritative sources for every credential that we collect, and so some of these data um, are input by teachers at the local level, um, and wanted to point that out to you as well. As we've talked about and thought about the bonus program, um, th there are a few things that I just want to highlight that, that we're thinking about um, along this work before Jackie talks about the, the methodology for 
some of it. Um, we are working and have been with the Department of Commerce around defining these. So that's been part of our pathways work for some time and continues to be a focus there. We want to make sure that um, we are elevating the work of the teachers who are teaching um, these students who are earning those credentials. And we want to make sure that we honor um, the legislation around the <coughs> academic rigor and employment value of the credentials as we think about those bonuses. To that end, um, you know, looking at the most rigorous um, hours and academic standards, we'll have some conversations about the number of times students can sit for a credential assessment as we think about awarding bonuses um, to teachers. And then finally, what employers say in particular about specific credentials for the occupations that we're hiring. Um, that last is, is one of the most difficult for us, and so we have enlisted the help of um, the lead division to walk us through that, and um, Jackie Keener will talk to you about the proposed methodology for collecting that data. <coughs> I'm Dr. Keener. I'm the Assistant Secretary for the Labor and Economic Analysis Division within the Department of Commerce. And um, this is, um, to full disclosure, I want to tell you our methodology is kind of evolving as we learn things, but this is the plan methodology right now that we're going through to assist with trying to identify um, which industry credentials um, and how to rank them. So the, the legislation is pretty specific. It, it requires that they, we apply a value of rank certificates or credentials and um, there's two components there there's the academic rigor component which is 50% and then there's also the employment value component which is 50% um, so I'm going to key in on the, the employment value because that's where we're going to focus most um, the other part um, we, can get, we can get the data from PPI and work with PPI and kind of develop that methodology but we're going to go through um, this um, employment value um, we have a lot of the data that's listed actually in the legislation by occupation for this. I have entry wage data we collect through the uh, Labor and Economic Analysis Division through one of our um, federal cooperative programs. It's the uh, Occupational Employment Statistics Program. I have growth rates also. Some of the data that Dr. Bottoms used in his presentation was, present, it was produced out of the Labor and Economic Analysis Division. And so we have that information. I also have annual openings. Um, Dr. Bottom showed by occupation for the state of North Carolina. Um, in looking at this legislation and thinking about the methodology we wanted to use, what's key and critical is trying to establish the link between these industry credentials and the primary occupation that's listed in, in um, the requirement. Um, so thinking about this and um, getting the brains together and lead, one of the things we, we really would, um, are going to advocate for and do is a survey of employers. So we want to get out there and ask the employers particulars about how these credentials relate and um, how they value them. So that, with that said, what we'll do is um, we're going to have a sample of employers that we'll pull. Um, and we're going to survey them to try to determine what the primary occupation is for these credentials. Um, the survey interest instrument will be online. We'll send emails out um, within the, the Labor and Economic Analysis Division, I have emails for um, a good portion of the employers that pay unemployment insurance in the state, so we'll be sending emails to them. And then we'll also probably do some phone follow-up depending on the response rate so that we can make sure we get a high enough response to make these um, uh, estimates for, for this employer value. Um, um, we're going to ask the firms also, and this is preliminary what the survey would look like, but. For each of these credentials, we want to ask them, okay, which occupations do you require these, this credential for? Um, which occupation do you prefer that they have this credential? And how important is it to, to you, that particular occupation when you hire a person? So again, we'll be using this data to kind of shape the, um, the, the rank as you go along. Um, when we look at doing this composite ranking that we'll, we'll eventually come up with, um, we'll use, again, that wage data uh, that's coming out of our survey programs um, and labor and economic analysis. We'll look at the growth rate and annual openings from our um, employment projections. 
Um, and then we'll compute that employment uh, value component. And then we'll also work with DTI to compute the academic rigor component. And then we'll add those two, com those two components together to create this rank. So preliminary, that's the uh, methodology we were, we're using. Um, you know, after we cr create this rank, we're going to have to look at where it stands and, and apply that to the process they're going to use to determine how the bonuses are rolled out. Um, rather than having questions to the last three presenters, we had a panel that we were going to do, and we'll just do all of that at the one time, and then hopefully we'll, won't run too much over. Uh, so if you three ladies don't mind having a seat out here, and Dr. Bottles, do you mind coming back up? We're going to uh, see if maybe if, if you, somebody on the committee or one of you thinks there's some interrelationship about what you were talking about and what uh, we are attempting to do with these uh, programs that we are paying for the testing and CTE and the, and the bonus program that's being designed. Uh, Gene, you want to join that group out there for now? We'll, we'll uh, let you be sort of like a panelist. Okay. Uh, are there members of the committee now who have questions for any of these folks about the morning? Uh, presentation. Uh, Representative Horn, good old Representative Horn. Count on you. Always for a question. Good man. Uh, first, a statement 67% of working adults will have uh, education or training beyond high school by 2025. We can't wait that long. We simply cannot wait that long. 2025, that's got to be changed. Uh, my question. Among a couple. First, uh, on, we talk about uh, certified career pathways and the fact that, as we just said, 67% of our working adults will need education or training beyond high school. I'm curious about the alignment between high school technical education, whether it be at community college or otherwise. And what are we doing here in the state of North Carolina with regard to alignment? Well, a key part of the career pathways uh, structure is that the uh, high schools, the community colleges, and the universities where appropriate have to be aligned in order to create the career pathway. So the classes that a person would take in high school need to be transferred to the uh, community college system and then to the university. But the plan is clearly laid out so an individual can see if I take class A, B, and C in high school, then I know that I'm ready to enter this program at the community college system to take classes C, D, and E and get this work-based learning experience so that I'm qualified for the occupation. So there is clear alignment between all of the different educational institutions. As well. I'm not I'm sure. I understand the intent, but I'm not aware of the mechanism for that alignment. Are community colleges and high schools, uh, is there a system in place to meet, to work through these, to ensure? Uh, we hear about remediation issues. There are lots of reasons to believe that there is a not a good alignment. So what actions are being taken to ensure the, that alignment? So as part of the process for being certified as a NC Works career pathway, they have to be meeting together with the employers and again developing these pathways based on what the employers say are needed to meet their needs for their occupations. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the northeastern part of the state, we... Since we were forced to move in here, we don't have mics up there. We need you all to probably project okay. a little more. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tell me if you can't hear me. I can, but I'm concerned about the people back over here and back behind you. Does this work? Now, if you want to, you can go to the mic if, if people want to do that. That might be easier, although that's more trouble. Uh, but maybe we can do that. Uh, so I'll give you an example. In the northeastern uh, part of North Carolina, they were our very first uh, certified pathway. And uh, that in that area, they had um, three workforce boards, I believe eight community colleges, 
and 15 uh, local area school districts that all work together with an engaged group of employers to develop a health uh, career pathway for that region based on the specific types of jobs that are in that region. So not only did we have workforce boards and community colleges and public schools working together, but we had multiple from each of those different agencies working together to develop one pathway that now all of those institutions use to make sure that their students uh, or adults or job seekers, veterans, whoever uh, comes, enters into one of those different uh, agencies has, this, has the information they need in order to most efficiently uh, qualify for those occupations in that area. Oh, yeah. That's Northeast North County. Are you telling me, are you telling us that this system is uh, across the state, that this is being done in all the regions? Uh, yes, there are currently uh, 21 different pathways under development uh, right now, uh, and they are being done regionally uh, because we know that the employer needs in uh, the northeastern part of the state are very different than the Triangle, which are very different than the Northwest and the Southwest. And so these are being developed locally and regionally based on the specific uh, employers that are in that region. I have two more points I want to make. One is we heard from Dr. Bottoms about uh, credentialing. Uh, he took a little different view of the quality of our credentialing than we t apparently take in the quality of our credentialing. And I'm wondering, where's the breakdown? Or what's the, is there, in fact, an issue here that's been uncovered as a result uh, of the difference between his presentation and your presentation. Who can help me with that? Well, I'll say first of all that I'm not sure which of the credentials that Dr. Bottoms identified as of value. So in his presentation there were 113,000 I think that he noted that he had discounted. So I'm not sure which of the ones he is still including. There are a couple of things that, that I will point out though. Um, of our 130,000 last year, nearly 45,000 of them were National Career Readiness Certificates, which are work keys, um, awarded because of work keys participation. While they are not technical credentials, they are certainly industry recognized credentials. And we have a growing number of employers in the state that recognize that credential for hiring. Um, and so, again, it's not technical, but it is recognized by employers in North Carolina. The other credentials that are listed, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, a large number of them are from state licensing and other state agencies, such as the Office of State Fire Marshal. Um, we have a large number that are through CertiCorp for Microsoft Office Specialists. Um, we have a large number that are from the National Center for Construction Education Research that are related to um, jobs in trades. So without Dr. Bottoms and I having an opportunity to, to look at one another's um, list in detail, it's really hard for me to answer. But what I can tell you is every step of the way, we've asked employers before we've included them in the list that we report. Um, and and I, in full disclosure, as I noted earlier, um, some are valued differently than others. Um, there's, you know, in, in the IT industry, um, a CompTIA certification certainly is more valuable for someone who's going to work in network administration than a Microsoft Office certification. Um, that doesn't mean that the Microsoft Office certification has no value. It's just valued different based on the occupation for which you're hired. Uh, can I interject? You want to follow up on that? I was well, going to ask Dr. Bottoms his yes. view of why, okay. why there's this rather glaring discrepancy. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Bottoms, can we ask you, do you mind going to the mic so we can be sure you're here? And uh, to expand on Doc, uh, Representative Warren's question, uh, I'm interested in, I, my recollection, it was 130,000 credentials and there were 113 or so thousand that you felt didn't really measure up. Maybe you could help us understand the difference between the 113 that didn't 
and the 17,000 that did. I think Joanne did pretty well. We probably need to sit down with a deeper conversation, but she hit the first one. Uh, we have never viewed work keys as a technical credential. We have viewed it as academic readiness and literacy in math. So that's one difference. And uh, it's a very useful lesson for getting at one's academic readiness for the workplace, applied academics. The second part, uh, there were a number of uh, credentials uh, that looked like they were in the programs. And I'd have to understand them more, but there were a series of Exams that looked like they were in the course exams. If you could tie three of one or three of those together, that could make it in the program, all three together. That would be one approach uh, as I look at those. Uh, and many of those exams are very short term in nature. The bar marshal exam, there was a whole series of those. Uh, I would, the question I would raise there at what point do you, do you take enough of those exams to give you something that? Credible and usable in the workplace that you're adaptable. Uh, a single exam short time period may not give you a foundational base in the industry. Those were the points, and I, and I use basically the criteria to look at all the lists. And one needs to go through these lists and study them a lot more than I've had time to do. And we did one study for one state, which we looked at almost 500 exams. And uh, we boiled it down, but there were number exams that were in the course exams, short term, but if you bundle three or four of those together, we felt like those to make a good in the program exam. That means you, you finish the sequence, you got some depth in the field. Uh, that's one illustration, and uh, so it's, it's how one frames these and carries them out, and uh, that's a criteria, that's the window we look through, and uh, to do that kind of work, mine was very preliminary service work, and I think Joanne's right on the money. We have to spend a lot more time talking through those, and I need to understand some of them in greater depth. But in other states, we focused on bundling these short-term exams together to make a program out of it, so that you've got, you've got the complete program. President, President Horn. That's very helpful. As, as often happens, it's uh, we have, as they say in the movies, a failure to communicate. We use uh, different words and different measuring sticks for the same issue, and that can cause some confusion. Uh, my last question has to do with the bonuses that were uh, that were established, and this is probably to you, Ms. Honeycutt. We're hearing anecdotal stories about teachers saying, "Well, I don't want a bonus here. I'm not, I'm not taking my bonus for completion." Now, I, generally, I find that to be more political grandstanding than I find it to be of any real value. But I am curious as to what, uh, uh, how that bonus system you see playing out, the efficacy <laughs> of it. As, as I recall, during the process of, of assembling the budget, we received some substantial information on the value of, of the bonus, that, that the outcomes as a consequence were significantly enhanced, and it makes reasonable sense. It's, I don't think it's the intent of this General Assembly uh, to, we're not pitting teachers against each other. We're giving them an opportunity to earn more money based on some outcome. It's not a competition of well, winners and losers. It's how we can all raise the bar. So I'd, I'd like very much for you to comment on that. many programs that you start when there are unanswered questions folks tend to be a little um, skeptical or resistant maybe um, I have not heard personally that we had teachers who said they weren't going to take the bonus yeah. <laughs> um, which is, is not to say that, that some have I'm not um, discrediting your information at all um, I think one of the challenges for us in the career and tech space is when we think about the credentials that have the most academic rigor. I'll go back to the CompTIA certification as an example. That certification is, is a very rigorous industry level um, certification and it it's lays out a number of standards that students have to master. When we looked 
at that for implementation at the high school, we knew from the beginning that we could not um, support students, our, our young learners, to master all of those standards in a single course. We, we knew that it would take our students more than 135 hours that they would typically have in a high school course. So we've divided those over two courses, Computer Engineering 1 and Computer Engineering 2, in, in my example. One of our challenges is going to be thinking about how you deal with school systems that have two teachers for computer engineering and a teacher has the same student for, has a different student for level one and then the, the student has a different teacher for level two. I said that backwards. They have, the student has two different teachers. If the credential exam comes at the end of the level two course after they've mastered all the standards, then based on the, the legislation, that teacher at the level two will receive the bonus when in fact the level one teacher actually contributed to that student's achievement of that. I think that's one of the things that, that we're going to have to think about and, and I help school systems design where they can ways for, for, for teachers to, to own their students and to think about that in a fair and, and equitable way. Thank you. Uh, other questions from members of the committee? Um, I want to try to, I want to go back to this issue that Representative Horn was discussing with Dr. Bottoms and Honeycutt uh, to be sure that maybe I understand what Dr. Bottoms was saying in his remarks. Uh, am I correct that in talking about an end of course credential that the sort of value judgment that you are making is that some employers are not so much looking for someone who has passed a particular course, but rather someone who has completed a program that says you've got all the coursework, which may be more than a single course, that enables you to do this job, and that the one course is just a piece of what is required, and so therefore it's like we would give out uh, the credential too quickly if we're just saying, well, you passed course number one, but you really can't do the job until you pass course number three or four. Uh, yeah, study of credential at one stage a few years ago. There were a whole series of exams being given that dealt with a course. And uh, we were trying to get a concept of a program, three courses, four courses in a pathway that will culminate. Now there was no there was no culminating exam at the end of the three or four courses. What were were a series of individual exams at the end of courses. So we call it Concept Monthly, and we gave several illustrations how they could bundle several things together and get a end of program exam by taking all three, if they pass all three exams, do that. Um, you've got a similar example in automotive. You can pass one or two other exams, but if you really want students to have the complete exam in automotive, understand the complete system of automotive is about eight exams you have to pass. Part of our concern was the equipping the individual to have maximum adaptability. If you pass all, all eight automotive exams, you have a skill set not only to work on automobiles, but to a whole range of other activities. One of the lessons I learned from here, if they consider automotive, you, you get those credentials there, that you have the ability to do a lot of the industrial kind of maintenance work because you understand systems, you understand motors, you understand the, the judicial part of it. So that was part of our concern that, that you couple bundle some of these together in that process. I, I like the idea that I heard here of uh, trying to rank the exams by academic rigor and by the, uh, the, the technical skill part. One of the questions I wanted to ask is I heard that recently I sat for the Board of Regents in another state and they, working with their state Department of Education, had looked at all the certification exams. And they had studied the exams and looked at the content, 
match them up to opportunities in post-secondary. Some exams carried one semester hour of college credit, some carried three, some carried six, some carried nine, some carried up 15 to 18 semester hours of college credit they passed the exam. There's quite a bit of difference in those exams. The question I wanted to ask, where is the community college for this in identifying which exams will carry post-secondary credit towards an associate degree or advanced credential? Is that, I didn't hear that being figured in. To me, that's, and one other question I want to raise, I'm, I'm intrigued with the 21 uh, different pathways being emerged by regions. The question as I looked at your data, is obviously that you have certain jobs in certain geographical locations of the state. That you'll not have enough people in those geographical locations to fill those high paying jobs. How do you balance out a regional need to an individual's need who may want to be prepared for a job that's going to be in the research triangle or in Charlotte, but they live in a different region of the state. So, so if you think about region, how do you balance out the demand in a region with a statewide demand? Because when I look at your data, you're importing a lot of people to fill some of your higher paying jobs. And so where do people in Robeson County find out about these other jobs and begin to have opportunity to prepare the jobs that may exist in Raleigh or in Charlotte? One, what may be a quick answer for you. Of the 17,000 or so out of the 130 that you thought were, I'm not sure what your term was, value, good credentials, value, credentials of value, what would be an example of one or two that would have fit into that 17,000 that you say, that, that one's a good one? Do you, do you recall? Maybe you don't. There were, I have to go back to the list, I do not have that. I can tell you the ones I remembered on some on the other category. Um, you had a web-based uh, certification that I'm assuming you would compare the sequence of courses with. Uh, uh, I'd have to go back and look at that. That's history. fine. Uh, okay, that's fine. But there, there were, and to tell you my quick look, uh, I judgment was made, it looked like certain exam would come at this, would be a, at the end of a program, meaning you got some depth more than just getting one course. And that, that could be translated into further study in the pathway post-secondary level, or it could lead to jobs. Uh, for a single course, my sense was that those exams were very valuable. I understand forgiving those, but if you couple those together with two or three more in that pathway, that would be enough to bond them together and make a program exam. That's the differentiation I was trying to make. Okay. Uh, one last question for me, uh, I think maybe from Ms. Keenan, possibly from Brian. Uh, in the work that you all are doing currently that you were describing about the 50% waiting for the rigor and, and the value of the course and that sort of thing, uh, are you all talking also about the concepts of regionalization and regular revisiting whatever you come up with to adjust for changing workforce needs? Um, yes, we're thinking about it. Some of it will be kind of dictated by the resources in terms of the survey. But one of the things we can do is, is sample enough so that we can do this analysis so that they would have the regional information. Um, and then, yes, we are looking at how to revisit it. Surveying is very expensive, and employers are getting hit by surveys all the time. And so we, in Lee, will be examining a way to kind of maybe refresh this information with some data that we can either get through um, looking at job openings or data that we have on hand. So yes, I, I want to I plan a sustainability plan to move forward to refresh the information. Okay. Uh, other questions from any of the committee? Seeing none, we're going to, I guess, recess rather than adjourn until 2 o'clock when we will resume. But thank you all for your time and efforts in presenting to us. Dr. Rebecca Garland, who's uh, Deputy State Superintendent with our Department of Public Instruction. 
Uh, this particular topic area that we want to talk about is graduation standards and remediation efforts. And Dr. Garland, I think, is going. You want to come up here? You got a. You got a. Okay, come on up here. And, yeah. And uh, Dr. Garland, I think I'll, I'll let her talk about it as she would like. But on the agenda, we have her down for current graduation standards and alignment with post-secondary education and workforce readiness. And then she's going to be followed by uh, Susan Barbita. Is that correct? Pronunciation. And Susan, ah, you're back. You want to come on up? We've got you a special seat. Is it Barbita? Barbita? Pretty close. Barbetta. Barbetta? Yes. Okay. It is in there, but Okay. Thank you. We'll see how long I remember. Okay. Uh, she is the Associate Director for Special Projects for the North Carolina Community College System and is going to talk about the NC Career <coughs> College Ready Graduate Program. And then we will have uh, opportunity for a panel discussion with the two of those presenters and Dr. Bottoms is still here uh, for us to talk about uh, graduation standards and remediation efforts. And with that, Dr. Garland, I will turn it over to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today to talk about college and career readiness. So I have a few slides and a couple of handouts that I want to walk you through quickly and I'll try to stay on your calendar and your schedule. So, I put this slide in because I think it's important to understand that everyone is concerned about college and career readiness. And so this agenda is being driven from many different points of view and purposefully because I heard today uh, Representative Horns real concern that we can't wait forever for this to occur. And so it seems to be an issue around which we are all uh, coalescing that college and career readiness is important. So the state board has actually been looking at college and career readiness since about 2006. Uh, and so I'll walk you through some of the steps they have taken, but the General Assembly certainly has had initiatives driving us in that direction. I remember Executive Order 1 when Governor McCory became the governor was that we would have high school endorsements to make sure that as students were doing their high school course of study that they were headed in a direction of a college or a career pathway and not randomly taking those courses. And if you will remember, we have our first report coming to you in September around those endorsements. I can share that about 60% of the students in the state have earned at least one endorsement and some students have earned multiple endorsements and so you are right on the verge of seeing uh, the first official report around those endorsements. The Department of Education, the United States Department of Education certainly with their purse strings has been driving us to college and career readiness. Uh, we now have our standards that were reviewed by the uh, Department of Education to make sure that they were college and career ready. And our assessments as we speak are under peer review with the United States Department of Education to ensure that they are at the college readiness level and that we are not fudging and saying that proficiencies are higher than they truly should be reported. Then we have national organizations that are pushing us to college and career readiness. SREB is here with us today. You have your National Legislative, uh, Legislative Association, we have the State Boards Association, the National Association of Local School Boards, Achieve, there are various national organizations that are truly interested in the topic to make sure that we are at college and career readiness. And then obviously, our local school systems also have initiatives. So we call it the Ready Initiative. We wanna make sure that all of our students are ready for college and career. And for us, to a certain point, that is the same pathway. To us, there is not an English and a math and a science for students going to work and a different English, math, and science for students who are going into 
universities and to our community colleges to a point where then students do begin to go down various pathways. But to us, it's very important that they all have that strain, that very strong core foundation so that if they change their minds along the way, they're prepared to go wherever they want to go. So why did we start College and Career Readiness back in 2006? At that time, what we were hearing from higher education was that our students could not read college level textbooks, that when they wrote, they wrote to a formula, that they were not able to write to a variety of different audiences, that they lacked the math skills necessary to go into some of the careers that were more uh, into technology, into STEM, that they were not able to apply knowledge, that they were very good at book sense, they could not apply it. In fact, we actually did at one point many years ago have a pilot test for our math and a grade where students were asked to do area and like 85% of the students in the state could do area. Same students further in the test could not tell you how to figure out how much carpet to put in at that time a library. So students could follow a formula to find area and even knew what formula to use. But to know that the area formula is what you applied to doing carpet in a media center, they couldn't get there. So we do know that just having a book sense is great, but you've got to be able to apply it in real world situations. We were being told that students lacked curiosity, that they weren't motivated. So these soft skills that we have to work on. And also that the community college was sharing with us that there were significant funds going into remediation. Now, what we do know is we were seeing growth over time in basic skills. And so this is a chart that was prepared by Dr. Gary Williamson, who at one time was the Director of Accountability uh, in North Carolina. And you will note that starting with the ABCs and moving forward, and I think the last curve that you see there uh, is around 2013, which is about the time that we went to our more rigorous, well, to the next level of more rigorous assessment. You will note that the bottom goes up. That is the level of reading in third grade. So over the course, starting with the ABCs, going through the READY initiative, student performance in North Carolina has gotten better. In fact, students read now at a much, much higher level than they used to read at the end of third grade. But it's not where we want it to be. And how do we know? Around 2006, looking at this chart, you will note that if students were proficient, on our end of grade test, they were not getting to the level that they needed to be to be college and career ready. They could get to the workplace, but the community college and the university system were above where the reading level took us, even if students were proficient on our test. So around 2006 or so, the State Board of Education formed a rigor committee and it also formed a testing committee that looked at what we needed to do in order to improve rigor in North Carolina schools. And so our goal in the past in the ABCs was that students needed to be on grade level. And grade level meant that they were performing well enough that they could perform in the next year. So if I was in the fifth grade, the goal was I could move to the sixth grade and be successful. But then there's a gap. There was a gap between where students needed to be to be at grade level and to graduate and where all students needed to be if they were going to be successful in higher education. So the purpose of the rigor committee, the purpose of the testing commission was how do we close that gap? And so where the goal had been grade level proficiency, the goal became college and career readiness for everybody. We were doing a better job with our students going to the university system. We simply were not doing a great job with our students going to the community college. Part of the reason, each of the universities, and this is not a criticism of the community college because they do their mission, but the community colleges have open enrollment. And so many of our students thought, well, I can go to the community college. I don't need to take a college level course of study in high school. So it was a communication problem for us. Yes, community college work is college level work and you need to prepare as if you were going to college. Community college is college level work. So that was a communication problem for us to convince our students that they had to prepare as if they were going to a four year university because many of those courses are the same and transfer over for college credit. 
So changing that mindset of a population somehow thinking that if they went the community college route, that they didn't have to be as prepared as if they were going to be a freshman or a sophomore in a four-year school. So we worked to change that message. So in 2006, the State Board of Education changed the courses that are required to graduate from high school. And we do update that list periodically. So on your handout, if you will look, and I do apologize, I failed to number these pages. So if you'll be unconventional and start at the back of the handout and go four sheets in, you will be where I am. So start at the back and go in four sheets. And you should be looking at State Board Policy GCS, standing for Globally Competitive Students, in 004. And what you have in front of you are the current high school graduation courses, the courses required to graduate from high school. Uh, what you're looking at, I did not give you the whole historical policy. I gave you the most current policy. And these would be students who are juniors in high school now, to give you a point of reference. So for those students to graduate from high school, they have to have English 1, 2, 3, and 4. And let me be very clear, in North Carolina, there is no basic English. You take standard English, or you take honors or, or AP English. There is no basic English. Now what I mean by that is, it is taught at the level that the standard requires, or it is taught above that level. There is no remediation English 1. Now that's not to say that a student cannot go back and retake for credit recovery, or they can't repeat a course, but we do not teach English below standard. We teach it at the standard level. Students have to take four courses in mathematics. That was another change that was made around 2006 to 2008. So what about math? The expectation is that all students will take math one, two, and three, unless the student and the parent concur that the student has a learning disability or has a problem with mathematics that would somehow keep that student from being able to graduate. If that's the case, the parent, the guidance counselor, and the principal are supposed to agree that the student takes a less than college rigorous course in mathematics. So about 90 some percent of our students are making it through math one, two, and three. Now what is significant about that? Math one, two, and three has been reviewed by the community college system. That was the level of rigor in the common core. It is the level of rigor in the new math standards that we have now. If a student makes it successfully through those three courses, they should be prepared for the first credit bearing course at a UNC at a higher education two year or four year to make sure that the student is ready or to send them off into a pathway. We still require a fourth course in math. The student has a lot of flexibility in what that student chooses for that fourth course, course in mathematics. So to give you an example, a student going to the UNC system has to choose a fourth math course for which math three is a prerequisite. So that student would have to take a course approved in advance by the UNC system that it meets their requirements. The community college system allows a little bit more flexibility unless a student gets, if you will, stamped that they are college and career ready. We call that multiple measures. So for a student to be stamped as ready by the community college system, they take math one, math two, and math three, and they take a fourth math course approved by the community college system as appropriate for a fourth level math. If they take that and they have a 2.6 unweighted grade point average, which is pretty rigorous, then the student gets to go into a credit into credit bearing courses when they get to the community college system. So those are two systems that we have worked out with UNC system and with community college system to make sure that our students can articulate and matriculate to the next level. Other students who are not planning to go to either of those schools then, or even within those students, if I'm going into STEM, then I might be taking AP Calculus as my fourth math. If I'm going into a social sciences, I might take advanced functions and modeling because maybe, or AP statistics, because I might not need calculus. I might need something that I'm able to um, 
deal with large data sets and understand what I'm reading. So the fourth map is designed for the student to be able to choose based on their destination of where they're going when they leave high school. But math one, two, and three should be sufficient rigor at that entry level to make sure that they are college and career ready. The fourth math is their extra additional mathematics that helps prepare them for the field that they want to go in. We have all students who take three science courses. Um, there are four social studies courses, and I, this is very important for this group to hear. One of those courses is American History, Founding Principles, Civics, and Economics. Please understand, nothing substitutes for that course. That is the Founding Principles course. A student may not substitute AP, college, IB, anything. Everybody has to take that course. In addition to that, students take American History I, American History II, and World History. So there are four courses of social studies for all students to graduate, three of which have something to do with either American Civics and Economics, Founding Principles, or American History. So I think we have the strongest social studies requirements in the country, in particular as it relates to American History. One health and PE course, which includes the CPR instruction that's in your law that we now have implemented. Then there are elective opportunities where students can take a foreign language, they can take CTE, as two of their electives, and then there are four more electives where we encourage students to form a concentration. So it might be that I'm concentrating career tech, it might be that I take um, a group of math, uh, a group of science courses, additional social studies courses. For example, the biology standards went out to companies that work in life sciences, and those companies reviewed those standards to tell us <coughs> that they either met the requirement or did not meet the requirement for what they expected their employees to know and be able to do. So we worked with, biz with businesses to the point that we could. And as you know, we are currently in the process of rewriting our K-8 math standards. Our high school math standards have been rewritten and in fact are being implemented this year. So the way that we have always <coughs> increased rigor and increased performance over time, and if you look that our track record that I showed you, this is the basic formula for how we've done it. It's not rocket science, but it's a foundational system that works. The first thing, we change the standards. We make sure that we know what students need to know and be able to do, that it meets with what higher ed is telling us, and it meets with what business and industry are telling us. Then we change our assessments to make them as authentic and as meaningful as we can and that they reflect the rigor and the standards. And then we hold people accountable, we report it out, and then we're able to work with the folks who are having the hardest time implementing. The level of rigor that we've applied to reading and math, if I had to predict, is going to take a generation for us to see huge difference. I think it's evolutionary, not revolutionary, but I do believe that over time, as the students who are in elementary school now, get into seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, we'll be able to see a significant, we're beginning to see a difference, but I think we will see a significant difference in what our students are able to do. Other strategies that are out there that then are sort of the ancillary, if you will, support to the foundation of looking at standards assessment and accountability you can see we've got Read to Achieve from the General Assembly. I won't read them to you. We have the virtual public school, the endorsements that we talked about. But I do want to talk a little about credit recovery. In North Carolina, we do allow credit recovery. So if a student is taking one of these courses and they're not successful, they have two ways that they can approach getting uh, successful in that course. They can do credit recovery by a modular approach meaning that they are assessed to find out what they know and don't know, and then they only receive remediation in the part of the course for which they were not successful, or they can take the whole course again. If they take the course again, they can replace their grade. So if the student is motivated to have a better grade, then the student can take the course again and get a higher um, score, a higher letter grade and merit grade for having taken the course. Higher education now offers students the opportunity to retake courses in many instances, 
And so we have offered that to students as well, but you cannot do it through credit recovery. You have to take the whole course over so that you truly get a comprehensive, um, another comprehensive opportunity to do better. We, uh, we certainly have partnerships, the community college system and the university system and the privates and independents. We all work well together to try to articulate across. Uh, we have our pathways that you heard about this morning. We have our multiple measures. The other area where we've had a lot of opportunity is through Career and College Promise, which General Assembly funds, which is not only our cooperative innovative high schools, mostly our early colleges, but also the opportunity for all juniors and seniors to take college level work in their traditional high school as long as they meet the requirements for entry into the course. So the other policy, if you start from the front, is what we call our course for credit policy. And this shows you the flexibility with which we're trying to be global and uh, 21st century and how we allow students to get credit. So students can take it traditionally with their teacher in their classroom. They can take it through the North Carolina Virtual Public School. They can do credit by demonstrated mastery, which means if a student thinks that they have already mastered the concepts in a course, they can sit for the assessment. If they're successful at, I think it's 90%, on the assessment, then they do a project, an in-depth study, if you will, associated with the course to show us they have depth of understanding, not just um, the ability to feedback on the test, the knowledge that they're supposed to know. And then if the project um, is of the right level of rigor, then the student can earn credit for that course and not have sat through it. So there are ways for our students to demonstrate mastery and move ahead. And then you also see which courses are designated maybe earned through dual enrollment at the community college or dual enrollment uh, at a four-year institution, which for the most part we're able to pay for the students to do uh, that opportunity. So. There is a lot of flexibility now for students to be able to move ahead if they choose to move ahead or for students to have a college level experience while they're still in school. So that has worked well for us. And also the very back policy shows you which IB and AP courses substitute for high school courses, which our Representative Blackwell goes to your AP and IB entrance. So what we have tried to do is put a system together where every child gets at least standard level, meaning they are mastering the standards as written, but then students also in areas where they have an interest or a gift are able to move ahead at their own pace and we're very flexible, even with students who struggle with a course and need to go back and take it over. Now what we have added on top of all of this to ensure <coughs> that students are being taught the way that they need to be, we have introduced effective teaching measures into our schools. So in all of our courses that are core, teachers at the high school level, their students sit for what we call our North Carolina final exams. The proficiencies are not reported. Students, the school systems use those tests and determine grades associated with those tests as they choose. But what we are able to do based on the number right and the number wrong is to give growth measures back to the schools. And so the principal knows in a school in which classroom students are not making expected growth. So if you have a classroom where a teacher is not producing expected growth with students, then the principal knows where he or she needs to do additional professional development, additional support. It is solely for the improvement of the teaching practices so that students get the kind of instruction that they need in order to be successful. So we have that for all of our courses with EOGs in uh, elementary and middle, and then we have it for our core courses in middle and in high, so that we can tell if students are learning across the state and in schools across the state, where they're at the level of rigor that they're supposed to be because the assessments are based on the standards, which tell us if students are learning it at a standard level. Um, and how do we know that we're there? So what you see is a chart. If you look at the bottom little lines on the left, each of the small um, short lines going up, 
The bottom line is where our EOCs and EOGs used to be in terms of rigor. The top line that you see is where our EOGs and EOCs are now in terms of rigor. And so if you follow that line across the top to that box where you see the dot in the middle, that box represents college and career readiness. And so if indeed our students master the standards according to the level that they are, that the assessments are designed, then our students will definitely be at the high end of college and career readiness. And so we feel like we have data to support that as long as we can get our students to master what we have in place, then our students indeed are on track to be college and career ready. Uh, any questions that won't wait until the panel? Representative Moore, do you want to go now? Later. Either. Well, let's go later. And we'll, uh, if there's not, if, is that okay? Write it down. We don't want you to. I did write it down because I knew I'd forget. <laughs> uh, Ms. Barbetta, do you want to, do you have a PowerPoint too? Or? Yes, sir. Okay, <coughs> well, come on up. And the, as, um, Specified by the legislation, the curriculum and professional development is being provided by the community college system, but again, in consultation with DPI and GA. The delivery of the uh, curriculum that's being created will be by high school teachers um, after they've undergone professional development. Uh, this committee has also been tasked with determining the measures for um, determining readiness by junior year. And right now we're working on that for our models that are taking place this 2016-17 uh, year. Uh, we also are uh, needing to establish the criteria for what is successful completion. Is that an ACT, an SAT, uh, the North Carolina Diagnostic and Placement Test, so we're in the process of determining what successful complete completion of remediation <coughs> modules might be. And we've been thinking about mastery-based remediation and I'll go into detail a little bit about uh, mastery based remediation as it applies to the career and college ready graduate program. What we are attempting to show here is that really this is a partnership with all the parties indicated on this slide. The community college system is the lead on this but certainly none of this work could take place without DPI and the university system and then all three of us Together, working together will create an increased number of career and college ready graduates as they exit high school. So to give you an idea of milestones um, and timeline, right now we're in phase one, the 2016-17 year. We have six college high school partnerships that are taking place this year. And the different approaches that they're looking at and uh, will be implementing are um, embedded remediation, um, some standalone courses that might take place in some instances the first block or semester of a student's um, senior year. And in other models, they're going to do this second semester or block of a student's senior year. Five of the six models are using technology, but we do have one college high school partnership that are, um, has chosen not to use technology because their partnering high school doesn't necessarily have all the technology they feel necessary at this point. Phase two will be next year and we'll add a minimum of 10 new college high school partnerships. We want to have at least 25% of the 58 community colleges engaged in this and hopefully more and we actually think we will have more, um, but that's our the bare minimum, an additional 10 partnerships. And then, as indicated by legislation, in the 2018-19 school year, this will be statewide. So how did we go about setting this up to make sure it was the most effective policy? We had uh, three subcommittees that have been formed, and they are around content instructional delivery. And it's really even a, sort of another subcommittee off of that, one for our math uh, uh, curriculum and one for our English reading curriculum. We have an entire committee dedicated to assessment. What data do we need to collect? Who stores it? Where does it come from? How will we determine whether this is working for us and whether it's valid? And then the professional development. And I just want to point out that each of these committees does consist of representatives from both the community college system, 
the university system, and DPI. And then our full committee, which right now consists of over 80 members, and perhaps you're thinking, how can you get anything done with 80 members? Um, I'll just say that a lot of those people uh, are listening and, and determining what we're doing and what's going on, but we have a large portion of uh, the members here from DPI. And this full committee provides, um, as indicated, the general oversight and the common communication. We found um, that perhaps people's perceptions out in the field, both at the community colleges and the high schools, of what this bill is all about and what's taking place is not necessarily consistent. So we now have one common message that goes out from both DPI and the community college system in exactly verbatim the same message explaining what, what this is about. The, the approach that the uh, model colleges are taking, uh, model college high school partnerships are taking, is really mastery-based remediation. So it's, it's not time, it's not seat time that determines progress. It's these, this application of learning um, so much that you've heard about already today. A couple of key things about mastery-based education that you probably are already aware, but I'll just remind you in case, um, is we minimize academic gaps here. I used to say there's no more academic gaps, and, but never say never. Uh, so perhaps in the past, students um, at every level of education enter a course and can do very well in five out of six topics and have a strong enough average in the class to pass the class, but they exit the class with the same deficiency that they went in. With mastery-based education, that's no longer possible. You cannot proceed to the next assignment until you've mastered the previous one. Well, another key point about mastery-based education that we really like about, uh, that we really like, is uh, the student has access to this anywhere, anytime. So though it will, will be taking place um, at the high school, they can also access it on weekends at libraries if they don't have um, computer or internet access at home. And they can pro progress as quickly as possible. Uh, again, as I said, there is mastery for the specific skills. And it's personalized, as you heard Dr. Garland already mention. Um, a student takes an assessment when they first begin. It identifies areas that they need to work on. And then the student's only required to work on those parts that they haven't demonstrated mastery on. So you're not starting from the beginning that this whole idea of you get it or you don't. If you don't, you start over. That's gone. Uh, for this remediation course, you're only working on what you don't know. So within a class, you could have 30 students all working on their remediation modules and be at different places at this, um, in, in each of their own programs. What we're looking at is NROC, which is net, uh, the Network for Resources of Open College and Career. Uh, they're specifically their Ed Ready, which is for math, and their English. We've decided upon this for our models, of course, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is there's some great national data to show the efficacy of this product. It's a nonprofit. It's membership-based uh, versus the um, vendors where you need to buy an access code that can be very expensive. Uh, but really, most importantly, is the data from several states, Montana, Tennessee, Nevada, South Carolina, Washington, just to name a few that show the effectiveness of students running through the NROC or the EdRed course, and similarly for the English. We're excited about the SREB that you've heard so much about this morning. Uh, we will be, um, these model uh, college high school partnerships will be embedding this math and English, or the math within the um, S SREB, uh, the, that fourth math course. Um, and we selected a lead college at the community college system to help uh, assist the college high school partnerships. That's Wake Tech, the community college. And so they'll really be managing the grant process uh, as it reflects the, the, the assistance to the colleges and the high schools. They, it's the same procedure that we use for um, all of our RFPs. They submit uh, and we, they get approved. And Wake Tech has the capacity to handle this grant management. The committee for the purposes of the model high school college partnerships has determined readiness and we're using the ACT benchmarks and an unweighted high school GPA of 2.7. So you'll see that that's very closely aligned with the multiple measures, just 0.1 away from the multiple measures, 2.6. 
going to be mapping the transitional modules or the remediation modules um, appropriately to the developmental education modules at the community college. Success criteria is still in discussion. Uh, some of the partnerships are going to retest their students in ACT. Some will be using the North Carolina Diagnostic and Placement, NCDAP. Some will be using the mastery for each of the individual modules. We've established a five-year expiration date for the traditional, uh, for the remediation or transitional course. This again aligns with the multiple measures. You know, we know as time goes on, if the student doesn't transition immediately into college, the effectiveness of the remediation may diminish. Uh, so again, for, this is for the models uh, that we have in place. And again, that common message between um, community college system and DPI. These red dots indicate where our partnerships are for phase one of this um, implementation. How did we choose these uh, partnerships? We surveyed the state and the colleges to determine which are already doing something with their local high schools. So what sort of partnering had already taken place? What are some of the best practices? We certainly didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We asked for volunteers, um, and that's how we wound up with these six partnerships. You've heard me already mention that for phase two, we hope to have, an, we will have at least 25% of the community colleges engaged in this work, hopefully more. We will have some preliminary qualitative and quantitative data from the existing partnerships to use as we guide our colleges and high schools into phase two. And certainly we'll be sharing uh, the results and working on our professional development. The legislation requires that success is measured in two ways. Um, the number of high school graduates that are career and college ready by determined standards or criteria. And then the success in the gateway level math and English course on the first attempt at both the community college and the university system. So that is how the legislation deems success. We realize that some students that may initially be further away from career and college ready, as indicated by ACT benchmarks, might not be able to complete all of the remediation work that we have planned for their senior year. But again, it's not an all or nothing. Uh, as we will be mapping the remediation modules to the developmental modules at the community college, students will be receiving the appropriate credit. And I use the word credit loosely. We, we realize developmental is not credit bearing. But they'll be um, have notations in their student information system that they've successfully completed some of the modules. So at the very least, students that don't necessarily, necessarily complete all of their work will at least have a reduced developmental education footprint when they get to the community college. And we're hoping this will, will help incentivize some of the students um, get this college work done now. We're not going to say free, we're going to say prepaid. Um, so some opportunities um, for them to not use financial aid and to get done quicker. And then these green dots here um, indicate uh, areas that Gear Up is currently uh, looking at. Gear Up is gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. It's a seven year cohort based program and they are going to be partnering with us for phase two of this implementation. These green dots are also areas, as you can see, that we don't currently have college high school partnerships and so it works out very nicely. And we're just trying to take a lot of the best practices that are already out there from different entities within the system and utilize them and build on them and not reinvent the wheel. Uh, we hope to reach back a little bit further than senior year and begin to identify students in the ninth grade and align with the career coaches. And thank you for your funding on career coaches. Um, and as I said, partnering with Gear Up and then contextualizing the courses. You heard me mention NROC and Ed Ready for the math. They already have a series of contextualized courses based loosely around career clusters, and so we hope to be able to build on that as well, knowing, as you've heard several times throughout the day already, if we can get a student doing math and English as it relates to their career aspirations, we're more likely to succeed. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, uh,
Barbara, thank you for your presentation. Now we've got Ms. Barbara, Dr. Garland, and Dr. Bottoms is still here. And we'll go to questions from the committee. And I think, by all rights, Representative Horn needs to ask that question that I sort of told him to wait on. So, Rosa, write yours down. Okay. Okay. I won't forget mine right there. I like it. I, I forget almost everything. Dr. Garland, my questions for you have to do first with uh, U.S. history. Yes, sir. It probably comes as a surprise, right? I'm no surprised surprise it's at not. All, I'm sure. sure, sure. Um, what I'm concerned about is the transition from U.S. history to A. Bush to AP U.S. history. And as I understand it, uh, according to, that there is now a decision to allow high school students to opt out of U.S. History 1 and 2 in favor of AP U.S. History. Now, maybe I don't understand correctly, so I'd like to. Well, I think I need to answer it in two parts. Dr. Garland, I'm oh. sorry to ask you to get up, but I think to make it possible everybody here I'm going to ask you all when you're responding if you would go to that mic. Okay. Must please keep in mind, yes students may instead of taking U.S. History 1, U.S. History 2 or American 1, American 2. They may take advanced placement instead and then they have to take an additional AP course um, it could be in political science. So they do have to take two courses. However, all of those students have taken the foundational principles in their US, in the course that covers the founding fathers as well as students and economics. And many of those students have had additional courses because these are students that take typically a variety of AP courses. So the students who are taking this already have a firm foundation in U.S. history or they would not be successful in their AP history course. So students may not opt out of the course that covers the founding principles. We did make that change in board policy last year. So every student must take the course that covers the founding principles. And they've had American history um, a couple of times before they ever reach high school. I appreciate that. I was quite frankly unclear in spite of the fact that I've probably been told the same thing a dozen times, I'm a slow learner. Uh, but now I'd like to switch and ask you about math. Sure. Uh, and it's really two separate questions. One is, as I understand it, uh, our high school students are not required or may not be required to take math in their senior year. They don't have a math course in their senior year. Is yeah. that true? It can happen, but it's rare. The student who might not have a math course in their senior year would be a student who was advanced in math in the eighth grade and took out um, math one, used to be out of one, in the eighth grade, and therefore they completed their math one, two, and three, and their fourth math by their junior year. For most students who do that, um, that they are successful, they will go ahead and do an additional math. They'll take the community college course as an additional math. If they're going into a field in particular that is STEM related, it probably would not look good on their transcript if they took a year without math if they're going into STEM. What you might find is a student who was very good at math in the eighth grade. They're not terribly interested in mathematics. They've satisfied their four courses in mathematics by the end of their junior year. Uh, the UNC system has told us that if students have completed their four maths, including that advanced level math, by their junior year, that they are satisfied that the student has the math requirements to enter the UNC system. And so we made that allowance after checking with the UNC system to ensure <coughs> that those students would indeed still be, have met all the math requirements that they're supposed to meet. So it's usually been a student going into the social sciences who has met their math requirements, but any student going into anything that requires significant math at the next level would be taking that math, a math course in their senior year. Uh, along that line, if I may continue, 
I owe you. <laughs> Along that line, uh, I've heard a lot of discussion about uh, math as it pertains to personal financial literacy or financial literacy. And uh, I don't know if that's included in any of the fundamental math courses or not. If, if you could explain something, what are we doing about that, if anything, uh, in preparing our preparing kids for the math requirements of life, not of a profession? Personal financial literacy, some, I used to be able to tell you that where it's located in statute, but we're required in statute to teach personal financial literacy. I think it's taught in a social studies course. Uh, but we also offer a very comprehensive CTE course that is personal financial literacy. So it's required for all students, but it's also there as an elective if students and their you know, faculty determine that the students interested would like to know even more. In fact, we have some good partnerships with some banks around personal financial literacy, the b and being one North Carolina bank that works with us. Uh, to encourage students to do more than what is required in that area. My last question, on, and continuing on math, is would you explain to me, please, uh, how you all perceive the difference between math as a standard course of study, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Algebra 3, etc., versus integrated math? The standards are the same. So a student who goes, if, if you take a state, for example, that does not do integrated math, then the basic standards that students would learn through Algebra 1, 2, and 3, or Algebra and Geometry, or Math 1, 2, and 3, at the end, in terms of the math knowledge gained, should be the same. The standards should ensure that. The difference if you do integrated math, which is what Math 1, 2, and 3 ensures, the way that we develop the standards and then the curricula around it at the local level ensures that students have to apply the math knowledge throughout the course. And so there is a significant amount of application if you teach it through math one, two, and three that is not necessarily there if you teach it in isolation. So oftentimes, to understand geometry, you have to have had some algebra. So by teaching it, as it's integrated, then you're able, students are able to see it as opposed to having to learn it conceptually. So it just ensures application of the mathematics in a way that makes sense to students. Follow up. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, come up with the right way to follow this up. There seems to be a more than a little confusion amongst us vast unwashed masses about integrated math and what it means and how it's taught. There are some, in my opinion, misleading videos uh, circulating in social media that further confuse the issue. And I'm trying to figure out how to deal with it and as a consequence I can't even figure out how to ask a question about it. But I do make that observation and as, as you know we may recall we had a, some proposed legislation in the last session regarding which way to go on teaching math and that proposed legislation was surrounded by lots of hyperbole so I'm trying to weed through it all and understand it and as a consequence at this point as I said I can't yet even formulate the right question but I did want to at least make that observation uh, because I suspect that issues like that will return in the coming session. So any help you can provide in bringing clarity would be appreciated, particularly by me. I think it's important to note that any time you make a change in mathematics, it takes a while for that change to become cemented and for teachers to feel comfortable. I can remember, and my memory will go that far, to when I was in school and we started what was then new math. 
and there was, you know, people were afraid of a new way of doing things in mathematics. It seems like mathematics has always brought out the feelings because as we become more technologically savvy and the math you need to know becomes more rigorous in order to be able to do it, then it makes those of us who are of the generation older than the children learning the math uncomfortable that we can't do it. I can't do the math that's in school now. And, you know, I have a doctorate, but I cannot do the math that students are doing now in high school. But our high school students can. And our math teachers, over time, with professional development, are learning more and better ways in order to make math more accessible and understandable to children. And any time you can add application to it, then the understanding is deeper. I remember teachers telling me when I was a curriculum director back in Harnett County Schools many years ago that there were students in CTE doing calculus, but they didn't know they were doing calculus. And the reason they didn't know they were doing it is because they were applying it in the work that they were doing. But the, if you had taught it to them conceptually in a classroom in isolation, they would have probably not taken the course because they didn't think they had the skills and knowledge prerequisite to be able to do it. So there's something about integrating it with real meaning. It's the whole notion that I gave you earlier around the area of a rectangle as opposed to the carpet. So it's the idea of bringing application in real world to mathematics. And it's easier to do that if you are putting together the geometric principles and the trigonomic principles and the algebraic principles because when you apply it, they're not separate, they're together. And so, you know, I could do slope with my driveway, but if you had told me I needed to do slope in calculus, then it would have made me uncomfortable. So it's just the notion, it's not the way that we learned it, and it is much more rigorous than what we had when I was in school, certainly. We'll put you on pause. We'll put you on pause. Representative Gill would like to get in on this. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I want to ask Susan a question. Uh, I noticed in your presentation that you spoke of professional development and it's in several of your slides. I'm curious to know, did we allocate money for personal development uh, as a general assembly? Was that some money that you had to pull out from some other source in your budget? And is there a need for additional money for professional development? Yes, there would be a need for uh, funds for professional development. There have been no funds allocated for this initiative. Okay, and, and the other thing, I saw that you had professional development for your high school teachers versus the professional development for the college student, I mean community college, and I'm sure that you would need professional development for your um, higher UNC system. So that means we're looking for three pots of money. No, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Uh, the professional development is being created by the community college system in consultation with ETI and UNC but it is intended for the high school faculty. Okay. The other thing, that's one of the questions I had to ask about. Career coaches. I, I know we uh, funded career coaches. Now, are those coaches in the high school or are they in the community college? They are in the high school. And do we have one for each high school or just one in college high school? Not every high school within the system currently has a career coach. What is the difference between a career coach and a guidance counselor? The responsibility. I mean, I just want to know because it seemed like to me that a guidance counselor could help out if we had the guidance counselors. Do we need both? Can I uh, defer to 
Good afternoon, Mary Shuking, Director of Governmental Relations for the Community College System. Um, the career coaches are really more focused on letting students know what the community colleges have to offer. And right now that's sort of in a model pilot phase. I expect that that is something that we will be bringing to the General Assembly at some point to scale that up. Um, they do not replace the guidance counselors in the high school, but they're really more focused on, on students and letting them know what community college options might be available to them. So we need both. Yes. Um, I, think yes. both do, I think both have a, a very distinct and okay. good role. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. Is that it? Representative Hill? Yes. Other uh, representatives stand. Well, there's a couple of observations that they'd like to about 12, 13 years I've taught third and fourth grade, and, I, and most of them are uh, public school, some are private, some are homeschooled, most of them are public school. And I've noticed an improvement, a big improvement in the number of kids who will, are willing to read out loud. That's good. Have it. We don't do a lot of math. This is Bible study. We do a little math, but not too much. But on the math question, I don't know how you would begin to schedule teachers and classrooms if you had two different math curricula in the same school or even in the same system. If you have students transferring from one school to another, from one system to another, and you know one student has had uh, integrated math, and the other has had the algebra, the physics, calculus, and whatnot. It seems to me you would have dozens of combinations and permutations of students, and so you might need dozens of teachers to try to figure out what they have had and what they haven't had and what they need. I, my, my mind fries when I think of how you would possibly even do it. Very good, Austin. Observation oh, well, thank you. When we, when we first job. started with integrated math, when, when we looked, when we looked at River, and the board looked at River, and looked to the places where students tend to perform well in math, and when you look, you see that students have integrated math in many of the countries where they do well. So the board's first thought and intent, and in fact the way we implemented integrated math, was by allowing choice. And so some school systems offered integrated mathematics, some school systems chose the traditional path. After a few years, our superintendents in the field started coming to us and telling us we need one math path way because of the very reason that you're talking about. We weren't even trying to do it within the same school. We were trying to do it in systems. And so you would start having students transferring from one system to another and students had had integrated math in one or they had had traditional math in another. And it was causing, as mobile as our students are today, it was causing concerns across the state and students were getting hung up in the transfer. So one of our superintendents at the time, in fact, he's a community college president now, oh, Jim, Jeff Cox. Jeff Cox, who was in the Northwestern County, Allegheny, came to us and said, we need one math pathway. And he chaired a committee. And so he brought folks in from across the state. And the field itself uh, debated the pros and cons of which mathematics that we should uh, embrace. And their recommendation to the board was that we go with integrated math. And if I remember correctly, it was like 85% of the people on the committee wanted to do integrated mathematics and therefore the state moved to integrated math because offering choice was causing a big problem just with mobility across school systems. So if you can imagine trying to do it within a school where you, you would not have equal numbers of students wanting to do one or the other, you would have uneven classes, I think what would have ended up happening or should that happen is that some students then, in order to get the one that they wanted, would have to take it through NC virtual, which means I might get my math choice, but I might not get my preferred method of instructional delivery. 
because it would be almost impossible given all the demands to be able to, to meet it. So I do think it would be very difficult to do. Well, now, well the suggestion <laughs> is that you might want to put together a mathematical model to show how many different types of instruction would have to go on in the same school to cover all the possibilities of students who had been in different things in different years and therefore are lacking prerequisites for this teacher or lacking a different prerequisite for that teacher, people need to wrap their mind around how <coughs> difficult that would be. It's not the same at all in English or social studies where you can just go, anyway, it's not the same thing. I, uh, I might interject, if I may, that this is a topic that I was considering for more of its own little section. I don't, maybe, maybe we do or don't need to go there, but if the members of the committee would let me know Later, you just email Dixie and let her know, or tell me if you think that might be a good use of our time. We can get Dr. Garland and some other folks back and talk about this in a little bit more expanded fashion. I will get somebody who can do the mathematical permutations for you. I'd rather discuss Churchill with <laughs> Rebecca. Okay. Um, the representative. That's up my area. Representative Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess it was my question was for is it Ms. Marvita? Yeah. You mentioned at the very beginning that of your presentation that the remediation was going to be done during the senior year. So my question then was, what happens to their otherwise senior year curriculum if they're doing remediation during that senior year? So the student will still take uh, their part of the for English. They'll still take their fourth year English course. And the other semester or block would be the remediation if it's being done as a standalone or will be embedded within a fourth year English course and similarly for the math. So this is in addition to, and uh, if it's a standalone course, we're considering it a mandatory elective. Other questions from the committee? Representative Horn, it's back to you. The bouncing ball <laughs> comes back. Uh, I too have some questions for you with regard to community colleges. I'm. concerned, perplexed, trying to figure out how to deal with this uh, completion rate, graduation rate business in community colleges. And I use an example and then I'll try to come to try to turn that into a question. The example is if you have a student who's uh, taking a welding program at a community college, I don't know how long the welding program, maybe it's two years, maybe it's one year, whatever, but somewhere in the process of that welding program and the student has, has gained mastery of, to some extent, suddenly finds, uh, gets a job offer for $35,000 or $50,000 a year to go to work as a welder. He doesn't complete the course, but it's pretty hard for me to say that that the school was unsuccessful or the student was unsuccessful when in fact the student was very successful. So I'm, I'm asking, I guess, about how the community colleges might reconfigure this concept of, of completion or mastery to not necessarily mean that they, they, that they fill a certain amount of time in a seat is that kind of thing done anywhere? Are we talking about that? Is there a way to to then evaluate the success of either a program or a school, not necessarily based on seat time? That is under discussion. It's a little outside my area of expertise, and I'm going to ask Wesley Better to come and start that. That's okay. Of the chair? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Wesley Bedard. I'm the Associate Vice President for Programs, so I'm uh, Supervisor Academic and CTE Programs, but for 12 years before coming to the System Office, I was Chief Academic Officer at Beaufort County Community College, and welding is an excellent example because in Beaufort County, if there's a manufacturing job, very likely it involves welding, and we had a, a great uh, 
well in program, but the situation you described is very accurate. In fact, we would have people that wouldn't even finish the course they were in. As soon as they got some skills, they would go to it. We worked with the industries locally and said, if you keep doing that, we're going to have a hard time giving you people that are trained for their next job because they won't have the full set. But you're absolutely correct, and we are looking at metrics to do that. The typical things, when you see somebody do a survey or a study and it says, completion rates at community colleges are such and such a percent, We've always measured that a little bit differently uh, at community college because a success, a person who came to us because they wanted a job as a welder or as an auto mechanic or, or even in the computer field, if they get the job they want and they have the skills to be successful, that absolutely is a success. And that's more of a success than somebody that might get a degree and not be able to find employment in their field. So we view that as a success. In our metrics, we do, uh, in our metrics at a community college and we do factor that in. We're factoring it in more uh, with jobs and we're working with uh, uh, labor and commerce to help us grab that data. Sometimes when a student leaves, you don't know where they went. You just know they left, but often they leave because they did find employment. We are working to get that metric, but we also, community colleges nationwide are trying to get metrics changed on the national level when they show those things and it's a little difficult to do uh, because they often don't factor placement or students. We view that a student came because they wanted a skill that would get, lead them to employment and they did that, then it would be successful. And also, a growing area in our community colleges and our continuing education workforce development where we also train for those type jobs. So a student may actually go through a short-term program and not uh, and complete that and get the welding skills they need. Uh, they most definitely are a completion. They're not, they're not even enrolled as a curriculum a student, but they're enrolled in continuing education and get those skills. And currently, we do not have a way of capturing all of that with our total enrollment. That's part of the things that we are working on within our system. Uh, and we, we feel we are comfortable. We can do that with our metrics. Unfortunately, the, the national metrics that are typically used do not factor that in, and we think that's a flaw in the natural in the uh, national, typical natural metrics for uh, completion rates. But if I can use this occasion to put in an editorial comment, if we have an effective longitudinal data system that would allow the state and its agencies to exchange information on who's in school where, who is no longer in school but is actually employed because they are paying taxes into the Department of Revenue or they're not unemployed because they're not listed with the unemployment office to draw unemployment benefits, we could do a much better job of determining uh, the effectiveness of some of these and effective completion rates based on the success of the individual in achieving their goal rather than awarding them a piece of paper. Uh, back to Representative Horn, if he would like. Yes, uh, not, uh, I want to switch back to you, Ms. Barbita. Uh, you talked about the fact that you're partnering with schools. I'm fascinated a bit with that map up there where and you're, you're partnering with high schools across the state in those areas. It all, as I look at that map, I'm quite certain that Every one of those red dots, and in fact, green dots, well, maybe not every green dot, uh, has as well as a community college nearby, but has a university or independent college and university nearby. So are we looking at completing the loop? Universities, community colleges, and high schools? Uh, there was an article of last year in the Journal of Higher Education about this, some things that are being done along that line in another state. That uh, I'm kind of curious where you see this going and what makes sense, or what's going on now further than what you uh, explained. Well, we definitely are partnering with our private institutions, um, uh, independents, uh, as well as the university. Them. Success will be measured by how the student, whether the student completes that gateway level math or English um, at the first attempt at both the community, all three, the community college, the independent, and the university system. So we definitely have that work going on. 
The committee does consist of members right now. We don't have anyone from the independents, but a large portion from DPI and the university system. So they are able to offer their input and their insights as to best practices that they're aware of, pro specific programs that are in existence at both the other institutions. And we are certainly trying to close the loop and be all encompassing and can use all three or four institutions. I am particularly interested in the bigger picture of the continuum of education. And that we are working together at University of Community College and K-12 so that we don't have these remediation issues in the future. And that, that kids transist more smoothly from one to another, recognizing that not all kids are necessarily ready to go to a university out of high school and that community college may serve their interests in many respects to a greater extent. So I would hope that you would keep us very much advised of how this circle is being completed and what, if any, policy changes need to be made by the legislature that enhances that opportunity. The last question, if I may, Mr. Has to do with the digital environment. As, as you know, we are making great progress in our public schools and expect that to have every classroom with broadband, wireless broadband by the end of 2018, and may well have it before, well before the end of 2018, to be the first state in the nation with that. How are we doing in the community colleges with the digital environment? In delivering education? I believe all of 58 of our community colleges are doing an excellent job delivering uh, courses in several different delivery modes, including digitally uh, with our virtual learning. Almost every class is offered either traditional, you know, face to face, hybrid, online. So I believe the community colleges are there. That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Jordan. I would ask. There's a program connecting high schools with community colleges. And one of the counties in my district was gearing up for that and something changed. And then the superintendent gave me some information a little while back. I was sitting in my office in Jefferson. So I don't remember exactly what it was, but is that enough for you to go on and tell me? <laughs> they were about to be the next set of schools to be involved. I, I, it sounds like it's either cooperative innovative high school, which I think we didn't fund any more of in this budget, or it could be something related to early or middle college. But if it's not one of those three, I'm not going to go cooperative. Yeah. But, um, so maybe I need to ask you guys. Yeah. But I think I'm going to go cooperative. You might want to wait a second. I want to ask you a question. <laughs> I think I can speak loudly enough. You funded the FTE and, and, and uh, allowed them to open with the FTE. It was the additional 300 and some thousand dollars uh, that was an additional appropriation to those schools. That was the part that was not funded for the, and cooperative, some, innovative. For the cooperative innovative. And some need that amount to be able to open. So. You, you follow um, did you have another question? Ms. Uh, let me uh, get slip this in while you're still standing there. In your presentation uh, on one of the slides that's entitled Program Framework Requirements, uh, the third, fourth bullet says establish measures for determining readiness by junior year. Help me understand, I thought that the ACT was given in the junior year and was the measure of college and career readiness. And am I mistaken, or why is that not the measure? You are correct, the ACT is given in the junior year, but the specific benchmarks, the specific numbers for each of the individual content areas on the ACT is still being determined to determine readiness for career and college, right? So it is the ACT, 
but different college, uh, community college, high school partnerships are using slightly different ACT numbers. Uh, can I ask Dr. Bottoms, do you, uh, you were talking to us about ACT and college residents. Do you have an understanding? Is, is this something that each set of community colleges or universities across the nation sets their own standard for what it means to be ready or is there a national standard that is sort of goes along with the ACT which is what I thought was the case. Well you have what ACT recommends as benchmarks which they have empirically set those based on a certain percent of students who uh, form mm -hmm. at a... Do you mind I uh, maybe it's my hearing but I'm worried about Lou Fabrizio. ACT recommends certain benchmarks for literacy, for math, for English, for science. Um, and they're, those are based on compiled data all across the country. And if you have those benchmarks, your chances of earning a B or higher grade or so and so, kind of based on probability. Now what? Some states have done, they look at those benchmarks and they have uh, met with their higher education folks, they've met with community college folks, and they've set some benchmarks slightly different, but they, they represent statewide. Normally, the research institutions are going to be very selective anyway, so they're left out of this. It's the regional universities and community college in their transfer program. They have set uh, uh, benchmarks in literacy in math and science. They've gone through those. And sometimes those are slightly less than what ACT has set. They start at that level. Uh, the STEM initiatives are left to the institution to set those benchmarks for STEM programs, even outside the uh, research universities. The advantage of that, all of a sudden, gives every school district in the state knowing what the benchmarks are that they have to meet in order to get into a regional university without remediation and into a, um, a two-year college and a transfer program. Now some have set some benchmarks for the career program in community colleges, um, kind of an academic readiness there that may be slightly lower than the college readiness. But in some Areas are, they're higher, but that's that's the pattern that's being followed in many states. Well, from the General Assembly's perspective, how how do we get comfortable with the idea that the standards are not being lowered in order to make us look better? Uh, I think I recall, and I'm not trying to be argumentative yeah, here. But I think I remember your presentation that maybe there was a percentage of 34% uh, or so of North Carolina juniors taking the ACT, I think it was in reading, or proficient, meaning that 66% were not. Uh, both Dr. Garland and Ms. Barbetta have said that with these new standards and the program we're doing, everybody is going to be career and college ready. That was the statement I we're going to ensure that they're all ready. So we're going to get all 66% to that finish line also, and they're going to all be proficient. How do we be sure that we don't think we're being all college ready because we simply lowered the standards so we can get some more people there easier? Good question. The, uh when you look at some of the placement exams you're now using to place, many of those exams are, are assessing items that students did not even have in high school. <coughs> so you do not have a good placement measure there many times with those placement items. I've looked at place, proper placement items. We worked with a NAEP group one time. We compared the items on the placement exams in the community college with the NAEP exams. The NAEP exam was far more complicated. But when your institutions come together, they'll have to, the higher ed have to be a part of this. You begin to set those standards. 
and some have set them one or two points lower than ACT recommended cuts uh, because they've been using that standard already in the state, but they still have many, they have a high percentage of students not even meeting those. So it's, you just got to have to make a judgment. You can take the SAT, the ACT benchmarks, but let me make a couple of other points. Uh, I'm very pleased with what I've heard this afternoon about standards, what you're doing to line those standards, and about math issues and things of that nature. Very encouraging, and I know your state did a lot of thought to that. We've been now five years working with, starting with Arkansas, how do you help your teachers teach to the new standards, the college-related standards? Standards do matter. They're important. But if assignments do not change, and if teachers do not know how to frame different kinds of assignments, you may not wind up teaching the standards. That's one lesson I've learned over this process. Secondly, applications in math does matter. But June, you remember we developed an applied algebra course a few years ago. And I remember sitting in an East North Carolina high school teacher went through 15 steps to solve that problem. The kids going to get lost in the step. You never allowed the kids to struggle with the problem and work it on their own. Make any sense? So much of our math has been procedural based instruction. So applications does matter. But if we do not shift from covering math, kind of a coverage approach to math, I'll tell you one story in Arkansas that illustrates this. They had two versions of algebra, honors algebra and an algebra that takes two years to pass. And honors algebra was the majority of kids. And the two-year algebra course were the minority kids, in this case, Hispanics. Most boring course since Moses arrived with the 10th Amendments. She decided to give a former assessment lesson to see if students could work a complex math problem could struggle through it, could take what had been covered in class and they could actually apply. If they had done drill sheets over that, okay? She launched that lesson. A couple of days later, she reviewed the work, came back in with tears in her eyes and said, you know, my honors kids did no better than the other kids. There's something wrong with how I'm teaching. Now, that's where I would raise a question for the legislature. You have all the standards in the world. Texas went from last place in math achievement on the day to grade eight to match Maryland in our states. we one of the top states in the nation. They invested heavily in professional development. Unless teachers learn how to teach math differently, away from just covering materials to actually engaging kids and working real problems and making them through, uh, you will not get the shift. But now they invested about 150 to 200 million dollars in that process over five or six years. These shifts in structural strategies are not easy to make. We've been at this for five years. It takes time and when you get a core group trained in the school, they retire. You get a new group in, you gotta start the process over. So if you really shift the most important thing to think about in terms of meeting these new standards is how you will shift the nature of instruction and require teachers to teach quite differently. That, it, that involves working with the teacher and the institution as well. So that, that's the part you didn't ask me for, but that's free. That last part is free. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'll add that uh, to your check, which is all for you. Other members of the committee with a, another question for any of the current panelists? Okay, seeing none, thank you very, very much. I uh, appreciate all of you spending the time. And next, we're going to move uh, quickly. I can find my notes. I know that it is our privilege to have Dr. June Atkinson, our state superintendent of the Department of Public Instruction, Dr. Lou Fabrizio, who's the director of data research and federal policy at DPI and Donna Brown, who is Director of Federal Program Monitoring and Support for DPI. Um, and we're gonna, um, I don't know, Dr. Ashley, you're gonna come do this, okay. Uh, 
what I've asked them to do, uh, and my intention is that maybe this will be a little bit of an ongoing process, so uh, I don't know that, it will, I don't know how, how long it will take them, but hopefully not too long today. You all are, are aware that the Every Student Succeeds Act of last year was passed. Uh, first new federal elementary, middle and high school education act in a long time. Uh, it supposedly gave states a great deal more flexibility and so this process is currently underway of developing rules and having input to the Department of Education in Washington. Uh, various meetings going on and so I have asked Dr. Atkinson and her staff to sort of give us an update on where we are, what kind of flexibility are we taking advantage of, have we run into roadblocks where the Department of Education is not playing nicely because they didn't really like the flexibility idea, I don't think, to begin with. So uh, with no more from me, I will introduce and welcome Dr. Atkinson. Good, af Oops. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for having us, Representative Blackwell, to talk about a really important subject. This subject is worth $514 million to North Carolina. So that's why it's very important that we continue to work with the General Assembly, that we continue to work with people across North Carolina to meet the requirements and to have a plan presented to the U.S. Office of Education. Just as a brief overview, uh, as Representative Blackwell has told you, uh, Every Student Succeeds Act replaces No Child Left Behind, and in your material you do have a briefing, it's labeled Document 1, that gives you the brief highlights of Every, Every Student Succeeds Act, and I encourage you to, to read that. The big idea is that we have to have a state plan approved by the U.S. Office of Education. And there are many steps we must undertake in order to get that plan completed and sent to the U.S. Office of Education. The plan or the law requires the implementation of this plan for the 2017-18 school year. So the big idea is what are the questions that we need to ask? What, how do we make those decisions and who must be involved in our getting to the finish line of presenting a plan to the U.S. Office of Education for its approval? Going forward, we will be drafting that plan from during August and September, mostly se September. We do not have a plan at the moment because it requires extensive input from many, many partners, and Dr. Fabrizio will cover that component. In November, we will finalize the plan as far as a draft, and then we will seek State Board of Education approval in December. Our governor has the opportunity to review that plan for 30 days, and then in January, it will be very important that we present that plan to you in a formal way of course, along the way, we need your input and uh, thoughts as we move forward. And so we have as a tentative goal to submit the plan in March, in March the 6th of 2017. The plan has these five major areas, accountability, assessments, low-performing schools, teachers and school leaders, and 21st century schools. The big question, that we must answer is this. How do we measure student success? And because of the federal requirements and because of the General Assembly's A through F system, we are automatically out of alignment. So we will have to figure out how we move forward. Do we just accept the misalignment and say that we will have a federal accountability system and a state accountability system. Or do we come together and have one accountability system? That is a very big decision that North Carolina will have to make. 
and we will have to identify how we measure student success. What is our accountability for the elementary, middle, and high school level? And in the legislation, it does require us to have a focus on academic achievement on our assessments. We have to include the graduation rate at the high school level. We have to include growth at some place. And then it is up to North Carolina as to what would be other indicators for student quality, I mean student success in school quality. And that's where we have been gathering input since the legislation was passed. And the law also does require us to uh, determine the progress of our English learners. And today we have about 12% of our student population who would, may be classified as English learners. So that's one big question. What should be the accountability for North Carolina schools? The other big question is how do we assess students? The law does require that we assess students in every year in grades three through eight in reading and mathematics. It does not tell us how to do it. It does tell us when to do it sometime during a year. And it requires three through eight in reading and mathematics. And then we have to measure once in elementary and middle school science progress. And then at the high school level, we have to measure once in high schools with reading, math, and science. And then you see a big plus. What else will we use to determine student and school success? So they are the two big questions for which we are getting input throughout North Carolina. There are other questions to answer, and they include, and the plan will require us to determine how we will provide support for our low-performing schools. It will require us to uh, indicate how local school districts will spend the money that they receive, and it will require us to indicate how we are going to improve the skills of our teachers and principals. One thing that is different from the old No Child Left Behind to ESSA is that in the past we've had a checklist, so to speak, about spending the money. This time around, we will be giving our school districts a blank piece of paper to determine how you will spend the dollars based on the guidelines with ESSA. So they are the big questions that deal with accountability and assessment and how we're going to support local schools. And now Dr. Fabrizio will talk about the progress to date. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Lou Fabrizio, Director of Data Research and Federal Policy with the Department of Public Instruction. And it's my pleasure to continue the conversation that Dr. Atkins has started. In terms of progress to date, we have been very busy since the very beginning of this law passing. And back in February, Dr. Atkinson and I had the opportunity to present to the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee. And at that point, we laid out a timeline of what we expected to do to meet the new requirements of the new law. And the new law, and, and Dr. Atkinson shared with you that brief highlights document. It's a one-pager front and back, but everyone needs to understand that the bill that got passed by the Congress was over a thousand pages long. So you can imagine that one-pager front and back does not cover every single aspect of the law, but it just hits the big highlights. But in the law, it lays out some specific things that all of the states have to do. And one of the biggest things is stakeholder engagement. It is stressed very heavily in the law. It specifically names the kinds of stakeholders that need to be involved. And so what North Carolina did, which is similar to what many other states have done, is we conducted several different public comment sessions across the state back in the spring. We held six of them. As part of our plan, we will be holding 
another round of public comment sessions later in the fall. At that point, we'll hopefully have at least some type of a draft of a state plan, which is going to have places where it has what I'm calling placeholders, where we haven't made certain decisions, but we'll be able to show the public, here's where a particular decision will be described or made, and then in a, a later edition of the plan, it would include whatever that decision is that's uh, part of the plan. We also, as evidence of the stakeholder engagement that we're conducting, which again has to become part of our plan that we submit to the U.S. Department of Education, we've included in your materials document number two, and it contains the names of over 90 different organizations or associations that we have either reached out to or organizations or associations that have reached out to us saying we want to be included in any kind of a major opportunity to make or give feedback on the new plan. So I'd encourage you to uh, look at that. We also have been advertising across the state a place on our DPI website where folks can go to where eventually we will post drafts of our plan as we go through that development process so anyone can go there and uh, observe what's in our plan. Also on our state website there is a place called Let's Talk and folks can go and look at that or go to that site where it provides them with a drop-down menu of choices, one of which is Every Student Succeeds Act, and individuals, members of the public, can make comments about what things are important to them that they want to make sure we are aware of as it relates to the Every Student Succeeds Act. And then, Dr. Atkinson mentioned the misalignment between the school performance grades and the requirements of ESSA. In your materials, Document number three has a column by column comparison of what we are required to have in our accountability under ESSA and what we currently have in the school performance grades. And earlier you'll remember that Dr. Atkinson made reference to progress of English learners. Well, all of you know that that's an important thing that we do measure in our state, but it's not ever been part of our Title I accountability program. The new law makes that a requirement, um, and it's something that, again, we will have to work, and we look forward to working with members of the General Assembly to hopefully give us more alignment. Well, we, we need to have perfect alignment to meet the requirements of the new law. Which then brings us to another area which is uh, causing us some consternation, and that is the Congress always says to um, the U.S. Department of Education, when a new law like this is passed, that it's up to the Department of Education to issue regulations. But as you know, as part of the rulemaking process, U.S. Department of Education has to first issue what are called draft regulations. And you may have read stories about how the U.S. Secretary of Education has been called before certain, mem certain congressional hearings because of the concern that the U.S. Department of Education is going above and beyond what members of Congress think was clearly stated in the law. And that's causing some hard feelings between the U.S. Department of Education and uh, members of Congress. For us, there were draft regulations that were issued for which there was a deadline for submitting comments. That deadline was August the 1st. Um, we, as a department, sent a four-page letter to the U.S. Department of Education raising our concerns with some of those requirements. And when, when Dr. Atkinson talked about whether we might have a state accountability system and a federal accountability system, the draft regulations that were issued by the U.S. Department of Ed call for one accountability system. And so we wrote to the U.S. Department of Ed and said that that's a decision that really needs to be made at the state level. The federal government should not be requiring that there be just one system.
because we have no guarantee that we will be able to come to agreement on what uh, the unified system would be. That's just one example of some of the issues uh, that have been raised by a number of states uh, as it relates to the draft regulations from the U.S. Department of Education. There's two other sets of draft regulations that the U.S. Department of Ed has issued. The comment periods for those are the uh, September the 9th. And at this point, I will be turning it over to Ms. Brown to talk about other aspects of the new law. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Donna Brown, Director of Federal Program Monitoring and Support. And I'm going to wrap up uh, this brief presentation this afternoon by giving you a little more detail about the federal funds. Jean gave you the teaser. Uh, we do receive typically about $514 million on an annual basis. Um, we're not sure, uh, based on what the appropriations will be by Congress, usually by December, we hope this year, we'll know what's in store for 2017-18. This slide illustrates one provision of the Every Student Succeeds Act that does not change from the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it's the way that the funds flow from the federal level to the local education agency. So basically, this illustrates that the state education agency serves as a pass-through entity. And those dollars, in fact, by and large, will go to the local level. And I'll talk in just a minute about a significant portion of funds that actually have to be made available at the school level. This, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, eliminates, and you may have heard about this, uh, 10 programs that were previously authorized. A few of those programs have been defunded for the last four or five years, so no significant change, really. But more importantly, it has authorized 10 programs, many of which have been um, historically funded even as far back as 1965. Uh, you've probably heard about one grant being touted as a block grant, and I use air quotes because there are some limitations around how the funds are used, and that's the new Title IV Part A, which is the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant. So just wanted to make mention around that. And now I want to go down to one particular grant, uh, which is the uh, majority portion of that $514 million, and that is the appropriation of Title I Part A funds. North Carolina's share of the national appropriation uh, is annually around $464 million, so you can see that's a, a large chunk of the funding that's appropriated. Uh, Title I Part A uh, is made available to all 115 school districts, and in 2015-16 it was also available to 94 of our public charter schools. There are provisions under this law, and have been for many, many years, that there is also an opportunity for equitable participation for private school students. So it's not just about serving traditional public schools, but innovative practices and private sector students as well. Uh, you saw the little flow through chart. For Title I Part A, when the funds go to the local school district, they actually are required to provide a majority of, the, of those funds in school allocations to the school level. And what this illustrates is basically the purpose and intent of Title I, which is an understanding that the most, the, the greatest impact comes from those decisions that are made as close to the classroom level as possible. And this is one case where the Every Student Succeeds Act continues to align with what the General Assembly has put into law, uh, Section 8 of your public school law, which speaks to school-based management and accountability provisions. So there has been a history in North Carolina of understanding that the best decisions are made close to the classroom. There are a couple other points that I'd like to make um, in terms of flexibility at the school level. About 94% of the 1,400 schools that are served on an annual basis do operate what's called a school-wide program, which allows them to blend all of the resources that go to the school, both federal, state, and local, and to use them for overall school reform efforts. 
approximately 80% of the funds in 2015-16 were used to support staff. So teaching staff, um, instructional support staff, paraprofessionals, instructional coaches, and in some cases, central offices support. And one area um, just that's very notable is this is one of the larger federal fund sources that actually provides opportunities for preschool programs to be operated at the local level. In 2014-15, and this was a little older data, we had about $48 million of the Title I funds being used at the local level, they decided. Um, we had about 69 school districts in that year operating Title I preschool programs, which served about 7,600 students that would not have otherwise had an opportunity to participate in a free preschool program. And that concludes. Questions? Uh, Representative Stam is ready. To whomever. Uh, if we uh, would we be aligned with the federal accountability if we went to a multiple grading system, you know, instead of A to F, what I proposed a few times, you know, like one for growth, one for proficiency, you know, multiple grading systems, would that get us in Dr. Atkinson uh, harmony, Ad harmony with the president? Dr. Atkinson has the answer. Um, we can, we do have the flexibility to do what you just described as far as growth and proficiency. To have uh, growth count as 50% and proficiency count at 50% or another combination. But where we are out of alignment, or another place where we are out of alignment is that at the elementary level, the only indicators in the A through F system of the General Assembly are end of grade tests. And the law requires us, the federal law requires us to go beyond just test scores and to have other success factors. Uh, as we've gone across the state, people have recommended certain things as chronic absenteeism, teacher survey, I mean, excuse me, parent surveys, student surveys. So that's where there is another part of misalignment because we have to add other success indicators other than just test scores. Representative Stan. Just to be clear on this grading, I don't think it, you know, adding the different percentages is the issue. That's like, I've used this before, that's like big teacher jello with your mashed potatoes. I need the one taste. But you need different grades for growth and proficiency. The federal uh, law will give us that flexibility to not mix our jello and our mashed potatoes. It has to be a, an accountability system that shows differentiation. And by using growth as one, as the potatoes, uh, we could do that and have differentiation and then use jello for the, uh, for the proficiency. So we do have that flexibility. Yeah, we do pending approval of the U.S. Department of Education. Well, if I can follow up, I, I hope y'all will suggest that. And maybe one good thing is come out of Washington. Uh, and can I ask also at this time, maybe on behalf of the committee, uh, on the timing, you know, you all are working to develop a plan that will comply, maybe align this stuff. You said, well, we don't have to, but we can have two separate things. But I think many of us would appreciate seeing a draft of what is proposed before it gets so final that there can't be time for a little input. And I'm, there may be a process you've already got in place that sort of ensures that, but if we could sort of. Yes, we have a detailed timeline. And when you look at the handout that we gave you, we just hit the big spots. But as a part of that, we want to actively engage uh, the General Assembly, uh, especially select committees such as this and the, the education so committees to get more. like this. Sir? Especially committees like this. That's correct. <laughs> so we welcome your feedback, and we, um, we look forward to working with you in a collaborative way to have the best plan possible our students. Yeah. Well, I have uh, two other questions, and uh, Dr. Atkinson, I don't know whether you or, or 
blue or brown. Um, there was a slide there that talked about low performing schools. Do we have to do something specific, at least like a minimum requirement, or do we simply have to say we are addressing low performing schools by, and here's what we're going to do? Let's let Ms. Brown answer that. The truth is we're not sure. We don't even have a template yet. So we're kind of going blind on some proposed regulations right now. But what we are trying to do within DPI is to align what's occurring under state requirements with what we will say will occur as part of our federal plan. Um, again, there are some, there's some nomenclature if you have it that's required in the law. So instead of low performing schools, they're called comprehensive support and improvement. So some of that we can probably work through along the way as well. So we are required to do something for them, but there is no specific requirement about what that is. And we will work to align that to what we're required to do in the state. And before you sit down, I oh, guess the, the, the comprehensive support and improvement schools are required to be the lowest 5% based on performance and or graduation rate. So there is that requirement for identification. Well, now, but will they get a separate pot of money or do they get part of this 514 or whatever you mentioned? There is a reservation of Title I Part A funds. So school improvement grants go away and old school, little school improvement. But now instead of reserving 4%, we will basically be required to reserve 7% where we will have some flexibility about which money goes where will be in the allotment formula and that will be a state Among decision. those low performing Correct. Whatever they are not going to be called. And we do so have some flexibility as to whether it goes to just comprehensive support and improvement or a combination of those schools and another group of schools called targeted support and improvement. So. Can we have flexibility in North Carolina to continue to call them low performing schools rather than having to learn that new name you just gave us? Our hope would be that for all internal purposes in the state, we could call them one thing. Uh, we would probably have to provide a list to the feds that says CSI and TSI, no. but we could work through that. Well, I've got one more question for you. I think I recall being at a meeting where they were talking about some portion of the funds, and I'm not sure if the portion is specified or which fund it might come out of if it does, could be used with the state having flexibility for leadership development in schools, like for principal training or superintendent or that sort of thing. Can you enlighten me on Will the state get a certain pot that can be used for that? And do you, will the plan say how we propose to use it or just that we propose to use this amount of dollars for that general purpose? That is a great question. Thank you. Um, the Title II Part A appropriation uh, does allow for a small amount to remain at the state level in state administration. That's the same as always. Um, it's not a lot of money and it's what the state has used historically to provide the professional development that has been provided, which includes principal ready initiatives. There are a few grants that are outlined in the new law under the big titles, but it's under a little subsection called national activities. And there is actually a national activities grant Now it's authorized. We haven't seen an appropriation yet. But it will actually be specifically for what you just described in terms of principal training, like principal preparation or alternative principal preparation programs. And there's a broader list of eligible entities that that may be um, available to, and it will be a direct grant from the secretary to those entities. So there are, there are several different grants that will be authorized under national activities. And I have a little chart that I can link with you if you'd like for me to. But uh, follow up on that. But North Carolina is not going to be entitled to a certain number of dollars we would have to, or some agency or entity that's eligible would have to apply for a grant and say, here's what we want to do. Correct. It's a, it would be a competitive process at the national level. But the state 
is one of those entities that could apply for the grant? I believe so, but I would like to go back and check the fact on that before I said yes yeah. for sure. Yeah, I appreciate if somebody could get back to the okay. staff on that because we really would, I think, like to take advantage of that. Sure. Okay, other questions? Uh, Representative Richardson. Thank you, Mr. I have a question regarding the um, AUF rating that we are now using. Will that have an impact on how you allocate the dollars to with the, I know it's generally allocated on your census, but would that impact the way the dollars will be allocated the way that we are now rating our school system? The General Assembly's AUF performance grades would not have an impact on the allocations going to schools. Uh, one of our challenges is that we have, with a state legislation, we have to generate a list using these criteria. With the federal legislation, we have to generate a list using these criteria. Then with some other legislation, which I will go into at the moment, the state has identified other criteria to determine low-performing schools. So we will be generating several lists. And when those lists intersect with the same school, then it could be that they would be eligible for the, the funds that uh, Ms. Brown just mentioned. Uh, I think, Representative Jordan, you had a question. How much money do we lose if we don't use that federal term for low performance? <laughs> My guess is a big fat zero, nothing. <laughs> We're talking $500 million. Our state budget for K-12 is about $8 billion. So we're allowing one sixteenth of our budget to completely determine all of our student success measures because that's what the feds want to do. That's just kind of an interesting situation considering that they have no authority to make us do anything because the Constitution doesn't give Congress the ability to do anything with education. So I'm, I'm just, this is very curious why how they're using this money, which came from us or was borrowed in the first place, to kind of whip us in shape. Uh, Representative Stan, did you want to respond yeah, to, the, to the I, statement from I'd like the to honorable that we Representative could, uh, Jordan? We could uh, double our lottery money and do away with the federal grants. How about that? Uh, if, if you want to take these two seriously, I, com I, I compliment you. Go ahead. Representative Jordan, one of the reasons why I said from the very beginning that we could have a state accountability system and we could have a federal accountability system. And one of the reasons why we objected to saying to the, uh, the draft regs that they had to be the same is that we thought that the state should have the authority to have its own accountability system should that be the way the state goes and then we would have the federal accountability system. Now having said that, uh, we recognize that there could be quite a bit of confusion when it comes to having two accountability systems whether they're A through L or green, red, yellow, purple or um, one through five or whatever or a star system. So we recognize that there could be some confusion if we have to. Okay. Uh, other questions from members of the committee? Uh, Representative Horn. I kind of like uh, Representative Jordan's suggestion that uh, we tell the federal government to go jump in the lake. Uh, so far, but certainly I am not uh, <laughs> suggesting that we don't, uh, couldn't use a half a billion dollars. But we've chased money before to our detriment. And that uh, can't help but play in my mind that we chase money again to our detriment. Sure, it's, one could say, well, it's our money, we paid the taxes, let's go get it. But sometimes the, uh, the uh, prize is not worth the race. But I am curious about a few things. I, I realize that ESSA is a work in progress and that the rules may well change before it's all over. Uh, as I looked at the submission timeline, 
And I lay that against what Representative Blackwell said with regard to the legislature having an opportunity to be involved in this, uh, none the least of which is because we've got two accountability systems at play, and we'd like to merge them into one accountability system, I think, maybe. It's going to be necessary for us to, to do that, I believe, legislatively. We need the time, given the, the uh, process. I'm not sure that we have the time from a legislative standpoint, unless the governor would do it by executive order. I don't know if that's even possible. And, and I see the governor uh, is, doesn't even come into play until December, which the whole thing is getting squeezed pretty well. So who's going to, on whose plate is it on, to determine uh, the allotment formula that you talked about. Is it, and along with that, there was something else that uh, I keep going back to where I noticed it, find out, figure out what I, I guess that allotment formula will be in the proposal uh, that we sent to ES, sent to the feds, is that right? No. No, uh, the allotment formula is determined um, by the U.S. Office of Education, given uh, the use of census, etc., so it is not a formula that we will devise per se. I'm uh, going back to the governor. Uh, this is what is in the what is in the legislation. We are working with the governor's office now. Uh, we are having contact with Ms. Catherine Truitt, who is the governor's senior uh, educational advisor to make sure that she is a part of the process. So nothing will be a surprise when we get to the point where we will have to submit um, a plan. Uh, we do agree that this certainly is uh, an aggressive timeline to have our plan submitted by March 6th. Uh, in our conversations internally, we anticipate that it would be extremely difficult to have the General Assembly to act before we could submit the plan. So we are making plans to be able to accommodate that until the General Assembly sees fit to either say, we want the part of the federal accountability system or we want to keep our AUF system as it is. Currently, the accountability system for no child left behind and the accountability system for AUF have the same components. We have end of grade and end of course test, and we report those. We do not have, we do not have, for our federal accounting uh, reporting, we do not have uh, the 80 20 split that we do for proficiency, but we have the same tests for both systems. And I might interject right in and inform that I am thinking that maybe with uh, Dr. Atkinson's uh, cooperation, which generally is forthcoming, uh, that one of the ideas, this is the second time they've come and talked to us, once was in the previous interim, about ESSA. And part of my idea is for the committee to re sort of remain on top of what's developing so that if we have to act quickly in February, that it's not hitting us out of the blue. So with her permission, maybe we can get a further update uh, in October, for example, sure. at our October meeting. Uh, and if we need to do it sooner, uh, you all can give me your input on that. But I don't mean to cut you off now, but uh, I just thought I would interject that. Yeah. Uh, Representative Richards. but we certainly can pull that from our technology system. And you want to know the percent uh, of how many positions. positions with, does this grant cover? And if it was not there, then how much money would need to be? Um, right. 
Some I would suggest company. that because of some of the people that are employed with those are going to be all over the boardwalk in terms of what they pay, uh, that's probably possible to get an exact count, but if you divide the 80% uh, of the number by the average teacher salary for the year in question, that's probably going to give you a, a decent approximation. But no, I'm, I'm asking numbers, not salaries. I'm asking numbers. Well, I understand, yeah. but I'm saying if you take the salary that they are paid, let's say it were $48,000 as the average teacher pay, and if you divide 48,000 into 80% of 464 million, it's going to give you an approximation of the number of people. 48, follow up, the 48,000 is for preschool students. I'm talking about 15, No, no, I'm talking about 40, not 48 million. 48,000, okay. if that's the average yeah, teacher so. paid this year, and if, if you're using 80% of 464 million, then 0 0.8 times 464 divided by 48,000 might give you a number, but we can let the staff get back to uh, Lauren, can you all maybe get back to President Richardson on the count for a number? Because the follow-up would be, um, if I may, sure. we're not only talking about teachers, we're talking about central office staff, we're talking about paraprofessionals. Well, that's true. So you can't yeah. I don't think that would And that would, that yeah. Yeah, well, my approach is certainly not perfect in that, in that regard. Yeah. Representative Jordan. Could, could we add to that request, how long would those decisions be budgeted for? Just a one-time, one-year thing? Or do we not know and have to pull it from the, the data? Uh, they would be funded for one year, but we have continued, Congress has continued to give us dollars for No Child Left Behind. We anticipate that that would be the same since six, 1965. Before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> further, I question, further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your attention. We're adjourned.